What's up, cuties? How's it going? We're gonna we're gonna do some dev. Hell yeah! What have I missed here? Oh, chat's already been going too big. Thank you so much for the sub. Hell yeah! <clears throat> Starting off the day with a sub before I'm even streaming. Well, before I'm even talking. All right. Uh. I was getting ready to start coding my hobby projects in Rust, but I'm glad to see the stream is starting so I can watch here a bit, then start. Do it on the side. Do them in parallel. Hell yeah. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna implement the IO APIC today. Um I think that's kind of the main goal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to program everything. Uh, basically to be set up, so right now we are programming, uh, we're setting up a timer in up. My music is too loud, I gotta fix that. Um, okay. So, uh, right now what we do is we register a timer that triggers, I, I actually don't even know, we never actually calibrated the, the timer, but let's say a thousand times a second, and a thousand times a second, that will attempt to see what what exactly is in the uh, serial buffer, and if it's a capital Z, then we'll use that to reboot the system. Now, yesterday we were looking at the IO APIC, and we kind of wrote an example where we grab that information from ACPI, so we get the IO APIC uh, information that we need. So I know where to find it, I know what it looks like, I'm comfortable with it now. So I think what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna switch from using a timer, because a timer causes noise on the system, Timer is causing these interrupts every single time. Uh, and so what, are, what we're probably gonna do is we're gonna switch over to programming the IO APIC to set the IRQs for the serial port, and then we'll program the serial port to only send the interrupt. Uh, I think there's a way to, yeah, you can program it to only send an interrupt on received data, not on like transmit, empty, or any of these things. So what we'll probably do is we'll program the serial port to enable the interrupt on data available, and then we'll use that to go to an NMI, which is probably the first operating system that's had a serial port input go to an NMI, but we're gonna do that, and on that NMI, we're gonna reset the machine. That will be our soft reboot signal, um, and then that way we can eliminate the timer from the system. We'll still keep that code such that you can register a timer if you do wanna set one up, but for pretty much all the work that I ever do, I don't need a timer interrupt triggering. So, Jacob, thanks for the raid. Hell yeah. Computerphobic gifting a, a sub to EXTFS. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for that. All right, so let's hop into it. So what we need to do here is to get the IOA pick nice and clean, we're going to parse out all of the information that we need from ACPI, and then we're going to put those in a nice data structure similar to what we did for the normal APIC. Um, and then we're gonna have some routines that we can say, I want, I want to figure out which APIC and which offset, which register in the APIC is responsible for mapping IRQ number foobar. So I'll say, hey, I would like to make a change to foobar, and you request that to this API, and it will give you access to that specific IO APIC, because there will be multiple on the system, potentially, um, and it will give you the uh, offset in that IO APIC, which has the correct register corresponding to that, because the way these IO APICs work is you can have multiple in a system, and each one of them might handle a different number of interrupt pins. So one might have eight interrupt pins, the other might have 30, the other might have 100. Um, so the IRQ you, is relatively complex. I mean, it's very simple in terms of like data structure wise, it's very simple, but in terms of Figuring all this out, we actually have to go through a couple translations. We have to figure out what IRQ number we want. We have to see if that IRQ number has been redirected or overridden. Uh, we have to check that with the interrupt source override. We translate that source overridden thing to the value that we look up in the APIC entries to find which APIC it belongs to, and then we find the offset into the APIC. Um, and it sounds really hard, but it's actually pretty straightforward. So we should be able to bang this out pretty damn fast. So what we're gonna do is uh, we'll go into kernel source ioapic.rs. This is the first new file I think we've made uh, in about a week on this project. We've been mainly working on existing 
uh, improvements and implementations, which is really cool. I love that we're getting to new code. The code quality is pretty solid right now, I would say. There's still th some things I'd like to improve and change. Okay. So let's see the information that we need from ACPI. So here's the ACPI spec, and this is going to tell us uh, we need this interrupt source override structure, which will tell us the difference between an 8259 IRQ, which is the standard interrupt that we're used to, these ones, these ISA, these like legacy IRQs, and for example, the pit is IRQ number zero, but on a given system, that IRQ might remap to a different uh, global IRQ number. So in this case, on this machine, this is actually inside of KVM, this remaps IRQ0, which is the uh, programmable interval timer, and it remaps that to the global IRQ number 2. And these other ones are one-to-one -one mappings, but I think those change the flags of whether they're edge or level triggered, so we'll want to store that information as well. Um, but anyways, I think that's about it. This should be pretty easy to set up. We've made example code here inside of ACPI that we hacked in place. Uh, so we need data structures that are capable of storing these translations, these overrides. And an override contains... Um, it contains the... Uh, uh, we want the IRQ number, which is really all we care about. So we'll grab the IRQ number and then the global system interrupt. And then we'll grab these flags as well. And these flags indicate whether or not things have been overridden. So if the flags are zero, we know that it conforms to the original spec. Otherwise, it might change uh, the polarity or the trigger mode of these entries. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this easy on ourselves, and we're going to assert that there are no flags set. We'll still store the, store the flags, but we'll say, hey, if you use a non-zero flags, this is something we haven't seen yet. I don't really know how to handle all these cases yet. I don't really want to look into that because I don't think it's something we're going to need to do. And if we don't need to do it, I'd prefer to omit it. I'm not trying to make a generic system can handle every IRQ. I just want to handle the IRQs that I need to be able to handle for my projects, uh, which in this case is a very small subset. So we'll store a source a 32-bit global interrupt number, and I think we'll just call that global interrupt. Um, and that's it, and then flags. So we'll say struct, um, what do we want to call this? Interrupt override, and we'll have the ISA. Uh, actually, it's not ISA, this is the IRQ. Do I need that bus? No, it's constant. Okay. Uh, we can actually assert that that is zero, so we will do that on our ACPI parser just to add more strength on that. So this is going to be the original legacy IRQ number, and this will be the global interrupt. Um, the IOAPIC global interrupt number. Global interrupt. I ah, will say global int. Let's say U32, and then next we have flags, which is two bytes, so 16. Uh, these are the flags directly out of the ACPI. What table is this? Uh, interrupt source override structure. Um, okay, uh, and we'll say if this is zero, if that is zero, then there is no change to the uh, mechanics of the original IRQ, such that the same level versus edge and polarity are used. Okay, so this structure, uh, define clone copy, and this will be uh, represents an ACPI Entry for an IO APIC interrupt override. All right. So, yeah, we'll see if we can get this working. I think this should actually be pretty fast. Next, we want to have a structure oops, uh, struct IO APIC. This is going to be the actual IO APIC itself. Um, and what information do we want from that? The IO APIC ID. This is 
the Apic. Whoa. I don't even know what I just hit there that popped that up. I legitimately don't know what I did that just popped that up, but that seemed pretty interesting, whatever it was. The Apic uh, ID for this IO Apic. It's like a pink menu or something like that, purple menu. This is the address. So this is the physical address, which maps the um, the IO APIC. Then we have the global system interrupt base, which is a U32. Uh, global int base, U32. The base global interrupt number, which this IO APIC maps. And then we'll also store a U32 as well. That will be the... Um, uh, I don't know, pins, interrupts, count, max, max, uh, max interrupts or something. That's kind of confusing. Uh, I need a better name for that. Um, we'll say num pins, and this is the number of interrupt, uh, what do they call those? What do they call these? Uh... Yeah, number of interrupt IO redirection table entries. Um, yeah, we'll say num redirects. Okay. Sweet. Uh, represents an ACPI table entry for the IO APIC. Um, this holds all the information we need to communicate and effectively use an I. APIC. So we will create these structures. Uh, we'll probably have like a, um, maybe we'll have like an add something public here, uh, pub unsafe fn add uh, io apic. This will be um, register a new io apic based at physical address. A patter and mm, with an apic ID, apic ID, and a global interrupt base, uh, global int base. Okay. So we'll take a physical address. Actually, we'll take the apic ID first. Then we'll take the physical address of the apic and then we'll take the global int base as a u32 okay nice use page table fizz adder uh derive not define what am i thinking here get that uh def derive clone and copy beautiful well that's fucking easy Okay, so this is uh, parse out the information about the IO APIC, and we'll grab the. This doesn't. This doesn't have anything more, so we'll pass this to IO APIC. Um, we'll say register IO. Ah, yeah, we'll register IO APIC. I don't like having to go to a new line, but that's a better name in my opinion. IO APIC ID base adder and int base. This will take a fizz adder as u64. Okay. Uh, register this IO APIC. And then we'll take a look at all these in a minute. Just turn all that off for now. So this should build. Uh, yep. Here we'll pull in. Use crates IO APIC. We'll pull in the actual module. 372. Save that file. And we did it. Okay. So that will call that function. It's not going to do anything. Um, we see the source overrides as well. So now we need to figure out what data structures we want to use. I think we're going to pull in lock cell. Um, lock cell. And I think we'll do a static... 
I'm trying to think if I want to do how I want to handle these mappings. Setting things up here doesn't necessarily have to be super performance. Uh, the frequency that these will be done will be relatively rare, so I would rather use a easy to interface with data structure than something that's fast. So I could do some like crazy map that then translates an IRQ directly like super quickly into the APIC and gives you all that information, uh, but I'd prefer to keep things a little bit simpler. So we'll say this is going to be a list of all the IO APICs, and this is going to be a lock cell of a vector of an IO APIC, and... Yeah, I think we'll go with this, and we'll we'll have to go through all of the IO APICs to find which global interrupt is, handles what we need, but I'm okay with this if it keeps things simple. And I don't know if vec new is const defense, so I don't know if I can do that in a global. I hope I can use alloc vec vec, but I could also see that not being const fn. Oh, and then this, the lock cell, needs the the interrupt source. Where is that done? Um, take a look here. I think uh, kernel source core locals. Core locals will handle that information for us, so we can go and find what we actually pass to that or the typing that we use on that. We use a lock interrupt structure, so we use this. Okay. So we gotta pull that in from core locals. Use core locals, colon, colon, this. This is at crate. Pull that in, and we should be able to say this takes a lock interrupts. You know what, I like the equals on this line. Oh, thank fuck, vec new is static. A and a vector containing all registered I O Apex on the system. All right. Hey, notice last night after you left that most modern I O Apex don't seem to support NMI. Linux seems to use one of the perf counters instead for that case. Interesting. Yeah, because it did say unsupported uh, for those NMIs, which is actually pretty interesting. Um, yeah, we'll have to try it on hardware. I find that very strange that they like changed the requirements. Well, if that's the case, then I, I honestly don't even want this code then. Um, Did we try doing an NMI on real hardware with our test code yesterday? Let's try that. Let's see if we can cause an NMI to happen um, through the timer. So we're in ACPI. We'll add this hacky code back in. And that was programming on two. This is the timer interrupt. And that will trigger an NMI when that happens. So we'll see if this works on hardware. Uh, panic occurred on another core. Yep. So this appears to the system as an NMI, which looks like a panic. So let's do this. It is working on this system. It's also working on this system. So it's uh, they are like both working. So Starting soft reboot. Oh, interesting. That seems to get stuck. I don't know if that machine is borked at this point. I do un NMI that. I block the NMI. Um. Oh, both these both these machines got stuck at that state. Um. Why would that be? Yeah, those machines are actually triple faulting. So they're coming up to reboot. Maybe not supported means subject to change. Yeah, that's probably the case. Well, if that's the case, then we'll probably skip the IOA pick. And we'd program a, a perf counter on the system. Problem is we can't get a perf counter on com events, but that's fine. We could just cause NMIs every certain amount of times. 
Um, so I'll probably take a look at that. But yeah, that's we we did notice that right when we when we were looking through these tables yesterday, we did see that it said for these entries it said that NMIs are not supported. So maybe we'll maybe we'll have to set up our own NMI handler through a perf counter. It's kind of a 180, but if that does say not supported, I, I definitely don't want to be using it. We know that NMIs are supported on... Uh, yeah, we know that NMIs are supported. So one thing, I could use the IOA pick to... Can I send an NMI to myself? Yes, I can. I can. Okay. So here's what we can do. We can program the IOA pick, so we'll still implement the IOA pick, and then on the interrupt from the IOA pick, uh, I guess yeah, we. That's not an NMI directly. I was thinking I could NMI myself, but there's no point at that at that stage. So we'd have to use perf counters, and like that 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 works. I've done NMIs on perf counters before, and I know that's well supported. Um, let's see, A pick, and. Let's look at the LVT, and we have the LVT for performance counters is that does accept NMIs for all of these. All other combinations reserved. Um, yeah, what would be a good perf counter to do? Let's see. Uh, is there a good perf counter that I wouldn't have to calibrate? to get good fidelity out of. Burn one core for PMC timer, and then NMI to others. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's effectively what I'll do. Um, and NMI will basically show up as kind of a panic. Well, in this case, we'll have to special case it where we'll have to check the performance bits. The downside of uh, performance monitoring We'll only be able to use the architectural performance events. And let's see what we get in version 1. This will give us the, the bare minimum of what is supported. Uh, obviously, APIC interrupt. We'll go to the APIC on that. Um, and that's on an overflow, and that's easy. We can set up an overflow to occur. The problem is for some of my research, I actually use the performance counter overflows. So, but I can check the flags. I can see which performance monitor caused the event. So we'll, we'll reserve one of the PMCs for that. And then there should be plenty more that we can use. So let's see what kind of events we have. Where are the architectural ones? We have the fix counters. Um, that's in version two where they added that. Okay, so here are the core things that we can do. We can do uh, core cycles um, when it's not halted. Okay, instructions are retired. Uh, so we don't want to use this. We don't want to use this because this one can be affected by a halt. This can be affected by a halt. Uh, we can use this. Reference counts at a fixed frequency while the clock signal on the core is running. Um, use the core crystal clock, TSE, or bus clock, uh, because it may change. should calibrate it to a time with a known source frequency. Hyper-V doesn't currently support nested vert with vert perf counters. Oh, man. Oh, man. Which means there's no way that we can get an NMI now. I think that nukes all of our possibilities for NMIs. So then I think we just go with probably not doing NMIs then. We'll probably just say, like, if you, if you permanently keep interrupts disabled on all cores and they're, like, spin looping, 
uh, then you're going to have to reboot the machine physically, which is fine, because that's a pretty rare condition. It would take a pretty bad bug to cause that to occur. So I think uh, I, I think that's the answer to this problem then. Um, rm kernel source ioapic, close that file, go up to here, get rid of this, and I guess we're not doing ioapic then. Uh, we'll go right into making a network driver. But yeah, perf counters are typically not virtual uh, handled for virtualization. So cargo run, mod ioapic, that's in main. All right, so I guess we'll go right to right, uh, doing a network stack, which honestly is more fun. And let's see if these machines come up. Uh, these are both bricked. I'm gonna reboot those machines to be kind of the latest states. So we'll get these going, this. Logging in, rebooting all these. Remote control, power control, reset server. <laughs> learned a lot watching you though. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, right, I, I learned a lot doing that. I'm now very confident in IOA picks. I know exactly how they work, I know how to program them, I know how to set them up. So, if that ever comes up again, which it will when I have to emulate them, because eventually I'm gonna be writing emulators for hardware devices such that we can boot Windows or Linux or whatever in a VM. And in that case, we're not gonna be able to, we're gonna have to implement probably an IOA pick, A pick. Uh, so now I'm much more confident on how those behave uh, in actual hardware. So uh, we learned a lot and I am, I will never lose sleep when I'm learning. Okay, so I should have soft reboot working. Yep, soft reboot uh, requested from timer. So if any of the cores, if any of the cores are responding to interrupts, we'll be able to tear down the system. So all of them, every single core on the system, is going to spin up interrupt handlers and a timer. Um, so what we should do is we should calibrate the TSC, uh, especially if we're doing a network stack, we should calibrate the TSC and we should calibrate the, um, what's this? Uh, we should calibrate the TSC and we should also calibrate the APIC timer such that we can set it to like a, a more known value. IOX APIC, which is the IO APIC plus the IOS APIC. Interesting. Um, I'll use the pit to uh, calibrate the TSC and the. Yeah, I'll use the pit to calibrate the TSC as well as the APIC timer, I think. So that'll probably be the goal. Um, but yeah, these are all soft rebooting just fine. All right, let's, uh, let's read through our code. We're gonna, we're gonna pretend like we're auditing our code. We're gonna go into the entry point. We're gonna kind of read through everything, make sure everything's documented, commented, and sane. And if everything's looking good, then we will commit this because I think this is in a pretty good state functionality wise right now. It just might be lacking a little bit in some uh, readability and comments. So, empty structure to implement locking semantics. Current running core ID. The entire bootloader is protected with lock, preventing two cores from running. Um, yep. Stage zero has a state variable. Stack fail. Nice. Good comment. Uh, global arguments that are shared between the kernel and the bootloader. It's critical that every structure in here is identical in shape between 64 and 32 bit. Bootloader entry point. This has uh, one byte past the bootloader, the end of bootloader. Uh, we also have a soft reboot entry, and this is a um, long mode soft reboot entry point. And then we have num boots. This is the uh, number of boots that have occurred. And I think that's, let's see if that is bootloader source stage zero. We're gonna see if, um, where do we actually jump into Rust? Right here, we pass in 
fresh boot. We push in boots plus. Do you have boots plus zero? We're pushing in four args. Oh yeah, because it's a sixty-four bit number. Okay. Um, boots starts out at zero, and it's incremented every time we fresh boot. Okay. Uh, and this is uh, starts at one. Okay, easy. Get access to the serial driver. We do this in a scope, so we drop it at the end. If it has not been initialized, then we will initialize the serial driver. We'll clear the screen, which we're not doing. We'll add that back at this point. Um, let's reboot, see what that looks like. Nice, okay. I do like that quite a bit. I'll print the bootloader banner. We'll store the driver back in boot args, and then we'll go to the next stage where we'll save off the soft reboot address. We'll initialize the MMU, bootloader source MM. Let's see if this code's looking good. I'm mainly looking for comments. I don't comment uh, trait implementations typically because the trait implementation will have its own comments. Um, this is the handler for when uh, we run out of memory. We just simply panic. Initializes initializes the physical memory manager. Here we get the memory map from the BIOS via E820 and put it into a range set for tracking and allocation. We also subtract off the first one meg of memory to prevent BIOS data structures from being overwritten. We get the lock on that. If it's none, we return, get the range set, go through these sections. The first rotation happens twice. First time we accumulate all the memory that's free. Second pass, we move all the ranges that are not marked as free, sanitizes the map. That is accurate. Hell yeah. Uh, get the register state. Here we do an E820. We check all the flags, the return codes. All this is commented. On the last entry, we break out. We remove that range. That is fucking wonderful, to be honest. This will get access to physical memory. Uh, and then it'll allocate it. Layout and size. Layout and size. Inserts that range back as free. Nice, super good. Check dad, that sub that, okay. So we check all of those, which is good. Next stage, we go into, we got the uh, kernel entry lock and we got the page table lock. If the kernel entry hasn't been set up, we assert that the page table and the trampoline table haven't been initialized. Um, make sure the trampoline table hasn't been set yet. That's impossible for it to happen. Here we're gonna um, print that we're about to start downloading the kernel. Uh, this is a common point for things to freeze. Uh, if the pixie boot process, uh, pixie boot code uh, breaks or the pixie server is unreachable, Okay, download the kernel. This will be a uh, print that we failed. Here, uh, downloaded the kernel. Turn it out of the loop. So I'll break that out of the loop. Uh, kernel download complete, that's fine. We're gonna parse the PE from the kernel. So let's we'll look at shared PE parser source. I think this code was relatively good. Um, these are not pubs. I'm not too worried about the comments on them. Good comments on all of these. Uh, one thing that I do want to keep my eye on is I want to see whether or not I want to see whether or not any of my structures are too open. Does that need to be pub? Mm. Yes. Yeah, because it's a wrapper. Okay. That gives these routines, translates, just gets the address, elec fizz, free fizz. Those are easy. So this is a this is a pass to check for places where I can reduce on safe code as well as places where I can uh, increase restrictions on public uh, 
uh, public fields of structures. So this one, I'm fine with this being public. If you corrupt your own entry point, that's on you. Um, I could make an accessor for it, but there's kind of no reason. Uh, it doesn't really hurt if someone ends up mutating that, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, okay, this getting my Tibia characters set up for training. What have you got supported in the kernel? Right now, we don't really have anything supported. Uh, we've got a virtual memory manager, a physical memory manager, um, bootloader kernel, and soft reboot. So I think the biggest thing that we have right now is the ability to do soft reboots. We've got APIC support, but that's pretty easy. That's really not a feature. So we're gonna add support for the uh, we're gonna add support for a network card, uh, which will be pretty easy. We'll write a gigabit network driver and a UDP network stack. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's really all I'll ever need in this kernel in terms of devices and functionality. Um, it's just not really much more I need than that. Okay. So. But yeah, that's that's pretty much typically what I'll implement in an OS is I'll implement pretty much just a um, network driver, and that's about it. Okay, getting this set up still. So PE parser, it's gonna go through, get the MZ header, get the PE offset, nice. Everything here is failable, which looks good. That's what I like to see. At least it, it appears to be. And I think that is the case. Um, check for the PE signature. Check for the cough header. Make sure it's inbound. Read everything from there. We have no unsafe code in here, do we? Nice. No unsafe in here. Uh, what do we have for pub? Sections. That's fine. And comments look good. The support looks pretty good. We support both i386 and x86-64. Um, get the virtual sizes. Yeah, comments look good on the PE parser, so I'm happy with that file. Oh, and the other thing I want to be looking for is whether or not there is a, mo uh, a crate level documentation or module level documentation. In this case, we'll say um, uh, PE parser for basic x86-64 and i386 support. Uh, currently, this does not support relocations okay so one thing that we can do is we can do we can go into the bootloader and we can do rust up doc uh, I think there's a launch or something or cargo doc help open so this will document everything unused attributes no main Okay, let's see if we can suppress that. No, there's not gonna be a great way to suppress that. Unuse braces. Yeah, that's annoying. Huh. Credit level attribute should be in the root module, it is. So that's something I changed by putting that there? Can I not put the comment up top or is this a documentation thing? Let me see if I, let me see if I get this when I just build it. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I actually have to put that behind. Oops. Oh yeah, yeah, cargo clean, cargo run clean, cargo run. You know what, I, I definitely don't need it there. It can be there. It's it's a docs thing. Um, rust up. Cargo doc open. All right. We'll just ignore those for now. So what I wanna do is I wanna look through and see if there's anything that's like dramatically lacking in uh, 
in, in comments, right? So in this case, we got the main Rust entry point for the uh, bootloader. And we'll say that this is the um, uh, bootloader for BIOS-based x86 implementations um, using Pixie to download a second stage PE file, um, which will be second stage x86-64 PE file, which will be uh, loaded and executed in long mode. Okay. So in trends, we'll add these bootloader source in trends. This is going to be. So this contains um, Microsoft specific MSVC convention uh, intrinsics. Intrinsics. And this is, uh, we translate the MSVC intrinsics to. 32-bit uh, intrinsic uh, to LLVM intrinsics to get support for 64-bit integer arithmetic in a 32-bit bootloader. Okay. Cargo doc. And we should be able to refresh that. Where did we put it? Oh. How do I keep that persistent open? Well, let's do cargo doc, and then we'll open it up here. Home pleb chocolate milk bootloader target. Uh, I'm guessing it's going to put it. Yeah, where does it put it? Oh, right here. Nice. And... Index. Where is the index? I forgot, but what are you making this kernel for? This kernel is for doing CPU research, so... No, it's not the JavaScript. Um, was there an HTML that I missed somewhere? So let's take a look here. Settings? Okay. Well, that, that gets us there. Oh, it's in bootloader index. Okay, that makes sense. All right. So, uh, yeah, we're building this kernel to use for, uh, basically, we're using it to do uh, research on the kernel, or on the CPU. So, we're going to use it to try to figure out different uh, side channel attacks that work against Intel and AMD processors. Um, kernel will actually probably eventually work on ARM64 and ARM. Uh, but this will likely be my jumping off point for doing research on uh, basically Intel processors mainly right now for looking for attacks similar to Spectre and Meltdown and also just learning kind of how undefined behavior in the processor works. Uh, obviously, un undefined behavior doesn't actually exist at the end of the day. The processor does do defined things um, unless somehow it's getting thermal entropy from whatever it's doing. So typically... Uh, I like to spend my time mapping out how processors actually work under the hood and what their undocumented behavior actually is. Um, that's often timing things that are you know, below a, a cycle in terms of resolution. So I want to get sub-cycle knowledge of how microcode executes, what kind of microcode is executed. Uh, I want to be able to infer, infer which microcode is being used for things like reading MSRs. I want to be able to observe the traffic that's done on load ports uh, so I can see what loads are being dispatched during speculation, what loads are being dispatched during uh, transitions uh, to and from VMs and to and from SGX. So that's one use case. And the other use case is to just um, build a hypervisor that's capable of running Linux or Windows or whatever I want to run and I'll be able to fuzz that. So I will write a hypervisor designed for fuzzing, which will allow me to differentially reset to uh, an inertial state. So it will be heavily optimized to allow for very fast resetting. Um, resetting is typically not something that VMs are, are fast at, and that's kind of what I specialize in. So the goal will be to have uh, VMs... I want to be able to reset VMs probably 
probably at least 10,000 times a second uh, per core. I feel like that number is reasonable. Uh, I'm doing some math right now to see. Yeah, I should be able to do like millions of VM resets per second. So um, 10,000 actually gives us uh, two orders of magnitude to kind of miss our mark there, uh, which is pretty solid. So that's a lot of flexibility. So panic. Um, perform, yep. Nice. MM. Nice. All documented well. Perfect. Panic. That's not documented well. Bootloader source panic. This is the um, panic handler implementation. And this will, um, when a, this is just the uh, system wide panic handler. Uh, oops, cargo doc. So now those should, yep, now we got those. Good. And then Pixie looks well documented. Real mode. Yeah, we can clean that up a little bit. So let's go into bootloader source real mode. And this will be uh, invokes a real mode software interrupt int number. Uh, with a given register state, uh, yeah, register state, the register state is swapped into the registers before the software interrupts, once the soft, uh, and we can put this on a new line, before the software interrupts. Once, once the software interrupt, uh, or after, after the software interrupt completes, the register state will be saved back into regs such that the results of the um, real mode interrupt can be observed. And here uh, invokes a pixie handler um, using the calling conventions that pixie uses. And this is going to take a seg off to the uh, pixie call, or pixie 16 bit API uh, provided in the pixie structure. Performs a pixie opcode call pixie call uh, and provides a pointer to a parameter at param seg param off much better and then if we go into these we get more information on those lock interrupts okay boot args i think we're actually pretty good on the bootloader side of things so technically, this isn't documenting uh, non-public things. So let's get that going too. Um, document private items. So this is going to be a lot more. Real mode. Oh, we didn't give a... This is handlers. This is routines and structures to perform 16-bit uh, calls from this 32-bit bootloader. Done. Okay, intrins, mm, everything's documented. Beautiful. Global allocator. All right, panic, pixie. Nice, and this has those private ones. So there we see the uh, some of the private calls. All right, awesome. Love that doc string syntax? Yeah, it's amazing, man. It's just all markdown. It's just markdown in comments. It's super simple. And you get uh, documentation that looks fantastic. 
in pretty much any environment. So register state, those are all public. Uh, what else? Bootloader main. Code-wise here, everything looks pretty solid. Download the kernel, breakout, get exclusive access to physical memory, create a trampoline page table. Here we create the that trampoline table, make a new page table, get the supported CPU features. If it supports one gig pages, use that. Otherwise use two meg, otherwise use four K pages. Load up the PE file, set the permissions on all those things, <clears throat> and then save the address of the trampoline table. And then all the cores will execute this. Get access to physical memory, create a stack, map the stack in as read, write, non-execute. Uh, and then return that information out and we trampoline into the kernel. So this is uh, jump into the 64-bit kernel. Um, we can do this. There we go. And this is jump into the 64-bit kernel and this is the um, entry point for the kernel uh, transition. So that'll go through the trampoline stuff. Okay, so I'm really happy with that. So let's check out boot args. Everything's documented in boot args, which is great. Um, bootloader, core requirements. Okay. Uh, shared core X source. We'll take a look here. This is the um, whether or not floats are used. This is used by the MSVC calling convention and it just has to exist. Okay. Good. And then here, a bunch of different things that we can access. Um, this is in shared CPU source. Okay. MSR for the active GS base. Why is that not showing up? Huh. Um, document private items. That should. I don't know why that's not giving the document items. Uh, the private items. Unless that documents to a different location, but no, no, that doesn't seem to be the case. Huh. Well, read CR2. Change those to do these ticks. Write to CR2. Read CR3. Write to CR3. Busy delay loop. Alright, so those are a little bit better. Got a timestamp counter. And then an unsafety, it looks like, yep, those are all unsafe, that one's not, that one is, halt's not, all unsafe, that's not, those aren't unsafe, which I agree with. Okay, lock cell, spin lock guarded variable, guard structure which can implement drop, drop such that the locks can automatically be released based on scope. And we have documentation on what all of these things do, which is great. That's unsafe. Lock cell guard. In our states. Nice. Beautiful. We actually, you know what? You know what? This code is honestly in a pretty damn good shape. <laughs> it's like actually pretty fucking nice. Pretty happy about this. Um, strongly type virtual address, strongly type physical address, page types. Uh, and we can add documentation on that shared page table source. Um, we can say, uh, the PML4, uh, physical address of the PML4E, PML4 entry, which maps the translated address. This is of the PDP, of the page directory, 
And this is the page table entry. Um, and we can say uh, none if there is no table present at this level. Beep, beep, beep. All right. So this is, um, uh, this is a page table flag indicating the entry is valid. Uh, page table flag indicating uh, this page is writable. And or table, uh, or table is writable. Um, is accessible in user mode. Indicating that this page or table should not allow use, uh, indicating that accesses to the memory described by this page or table should be strongly uncached. Um, page table flag indicating that this page entry is a large page. And page table flag indicating the uh, page or table is not to be executable. Okay. Clean these things up. All right. Oh, yeah. Traits, Fizmem. And this is uh, a trait that allows generic access to physical memory. This allows the user of the page table to uh, handle the physical to virtual translations that the page table uses during walks. Um, uh, a user can implement nested paging, uh, nested paging, or like, uh, a user can control the uh, physical translations such that this can be used to perform nested paging uh, lookups given the uh, fizzmem implementation for the uh, guest CR3. Um, correctly uses the EPT, the extended, uh, the, yeah, I think extended page table, um, uses the EPT for the VM to provide guest fizz to host physical translations. All right. Um, this also allows the user to provide mechanisms for the page table code to allocate and free page, uh, physical memory such that page tables can be dropped. Uh, page tables can be, hmm. Page tables and pages can be freed when they are unmapped. Nice. And then alloc to zero is automatically implemented. So that looks good. Good documentation on these. PE parser, that one's in good shape. Range set, that's in good shape. We even mentioned why we don't use range inclusive. Yep, we got documentation items for all of these. Serial port, documentation on all of these. I think that's it for documentation. Um, so there are a couple things that I have on my notepad here. I want to get rid of non-pub core locals or I'm gonna get rid of some pu uh, public core locals. So in the kernel, we have the core locals which are accessible to your specific core. 
We'll take a look at these. Um, Pubstruct Atomic Wrath. And this is a uh, guard structure that allows automatic dereferencing. Uh, reference count decrementing on auto atomic ref when why not make your vm what do you mean by that that's what we're going to be doing we're going to be make we're going to be making our own hypervisor uh decrementing on atomic auto refs uh, when the increment goes out of scope, this is going to be uh, create a new automatic the tracked uh, reference counter, atomic reference counter. It's going to be uh, returns the current number of references, and this will be uh, increments the reference counts and return a guard structure which will release the or will decrement the count once the vm or once the guard goes out of scope okay that's good a shortcut to get access to the core locals I was talking about making something like Kimi or VMware. That's exactly what we're doing. <clears throat> we're going to drop. This will uh, decrement the reference counts. Uh, make sure we didn't end up going negative. This should never happen. Okay, we got the core locals here. So we got a... An ID, got a public reference to the boot args. Um, we can't replace that, so that's fine. This gives you access to the APIC via a lock cell, which is acceptable. This gives access to interrupts. Um... That should be fine, getting access to the free list. I think it's just this one. I think this is the only one. No, you're making a kernel, not a VM. I, I am making a VM, I'm making a hypervisor. You gotta make a kernel if you want a hypervisor. <clears throat> Unless you're writing it in a driver, but we're writing the kernel and the hypervisor together. So, in our depth, uh, this should fail to build now. Uh, cardio clean, cardio run, because I think something's relying on that being pub. Really? Huh. Okay. Nice. Uh, set the core's current APIC ID on safe. Get the core's current APIC ID. It returns none if it hasn't been initialized. This will um, uh, set that we have entered an exception handler. Um, okay, this will get whether or not we're currently in an exception handler. This will uh, incre uh, set that we're currently in an interrupt. Um, increments interrupt count. And this will increment exception count. Then this uh, gets whether or not we're currently in an interrupt handler. This will uh, disable interrupts and increase the interrupt disable uh, reference counts. Um, Interrupts will always be disabled when this code executes. Well, technically, is there a race there? No, there isn't, because we'll disable. Interrupts will always be disabled when this code executes. 
Um, honestly, I might make these unsafe. Because you can theoretically... Yeah, I'm going to call this unsafe. Uh, interrupts will always be disabled when this code executes. This will increment the number of disable requ uh, requests. And thus, interrupts will not be re-enabled until an identical number of enable interrupts call. Uh, interrupts are called. Same thing here. This is going to... Um, attempt to enable interrupts. If the reference count for if the reference count for requested interrupt disables uh, drops to zero, then we actually enable interrupts. Otherwise, we just decrement the interrupt interrupt request number. And then here, if we're not in an interrupt, we decremented the interrupt out standing to zero. We can actually enable interrupts. Um, and this is, since it's possible, interrupts can be enabled when we enter an interrupt. If we acquire a lock in an interrupt and release it, it may attempt to re-enable interrupts. Thus, we never allow enabling interrupts from an interrupt handler. If interrupts, uh, this means interrupts will correctly get re-enabled in this case when the IRET loads the old interrupt flag. Okay. Get reference to the core locals. Um, temporarily set the GS base to the core ID for early locks. This is going, then we, here, this is a dummy structure to allow early um, lock cell access prior to having uh, the core macro set up. Okay. Uh, the, this dummy interrupt state implementation always reports no always reports no uh, interrupts or exceptions as this code is run during early boot prior to interrupts convert the boot args create the core locals construct the core locals and then move the core locals into this allocation. And then uh, set, set the GS base such that we can get access to core locals in any context via the core macro. All right, 97 in panic. Oh yeah, and that since that's not pub mod. Oh, we're not documenting the kernel. Okay. Yeah, so now we can go uh we'll get this building first. Kernel source core. Well, new ice cube was made in my fridge. Made a really must have fell to the bottom of the fridge. Unsafe. Unsafe. Okay, enable interrupts. This is in kernel source main. We're now ready for interrupts. Spooky ice, yeah, it makes me like jump every time that happens. Here's the core check-in. Let the AC, let ACPI know we booted. And that should be good. Uh, this will also serialize until all cores have come up. Once all cores are online, this will release all of the cores. This 
ensures that no kernel task ends up hogging locks uh, which are needed during bootloader uh, stack creation on other cores. This makes sure that by the time cores get free reign of execution, we've enabled, um, we've initialized all cores to a state where uh, NMIs and soft reboots work. Okay. Panic. This calls disable interrupts. All right. 188. Oh, yeah. The actual unsafe CPU sets. No longer unsafe. Cargo run clean. Cargo run. No warnings. No errors. Bootloader fits in size. That looks really good. So this will be... Um, and this will be... If we had a panic on the BSP, uh, we handle it quite uniquely. Uh, we'll shut down all other processors by sending them NMIs and waiting for them to check into uh, a halted state. Okay. Get access to the current APIC. Disable all other cores, waiting for them to check in, notifying us that they have gone into a permanent halt state, <clears throat> which is perfect. Uh, lock the old serial port. We can actually add that back in. That's why we do this uh, code review, because we'll miss things like that that we had for debugging. This is the uh, panic implementation for the kernel. Uh, create an emergency serial port. We disabled all other cores, so we reinitialize the serial port to make sure it's in the same state. We get that, we implement string for it, wrap up the serial driver in our writer, print information about the panics, uh, wait for a soft reboot to be requested, and then at this point, uh, start a soft reboot. Cool. Save the panic info about this core, forcibly get access to the current APIC, largely safe in almost any situation, notify the BSP that we panicked, sending it an NMI, and then halt forever. Okay, that looks good. 96, unclosed. Oh. Done. Fixed. All right, let's go into the kernel, and we'll do a cargo dock on the kernel. We'll open that, and we'll see what this looks like. Uh, cargo dock. Now I'll load this up here. Oh. I thought I had that in my clipboard, but apparently I do not. There we go. All right, let's take a look at our kernel documentation. Oh, we're pretty thin here. ACPI, good documentation here. Um, APIC states. Uh, let's document those, the APIC states. So we'll go into kernel source ACPI. My man, I'm loving the content. I'm going through every stream for the, from the beginning. Could you please try to use dark themes on the Rust documentation pretty much elsewhere when streaming? Losing my retinas every time you switch windows. Yeah, unfortunately, the dark mode doesn't persist uh, in Rust doc. Was he here? Um... Oh, it's here. But yeah, for some reason, this wasn't persisting. But it's also not going to work for uh, PDFs and stuff that we'll be going to. So unfortunately, there's not too much I can do about that. Um, disable interruptions is halted forever. OK, we do have documentation on all those. Max cores, maximum number of loud cores on the system. Apix, list of all valid Apix on the system. Apix ID is the index into the array. The array entry atomic U8 is the U8 representation of an APIC state enum. Uh, 
um, hey, sarcastic Dante, how are you doing today? Total cores, we looked at that one. Core check-in, check-in that is booted. Get the core state for a given APIC ID. Initialize the ACPI subsystem. Brings up all cores on the system. Get the number of cores present on the system. Parse the header. MADT SRAT, set the core state. Yeah, these are non-pubs, sweet. So we already got non-pubs. Yeah, see, we like, we, we lost it. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, it, it, just, it just doesn't really stay. I don't know why. APIC, good documentation, good documentation. Um, we can technically add documentation on that. So this is um, this is a, a local APIC implementation uh, providing support to access um, the APIC in either X APIC. Uh, or x2 apic mode, depending on what is supported. Okay. All those registers, and this is uh, apic has been set to normal apic mode, and this is uh, apic supports, and has been programmed to use x2 apic mode. All right, so that should help with those. Bitbore, hoping this will be interesting. What are you working on? I'm working on a kernel right now, uh, all in Rust. Nice, good, do good documentation on all these. Uh, kernel written in Rust and a bootloader. So we finished up the bootloader. The kernel, we're pretty much just about done with the core. So we're about to start working on a network driver, but we're just kind of cleaning up the code, making sure everything's documented well, and we're going to push this out. Uh, that's pub fn. Should I be unsafe? Yeah. We'll make that unsafe. And apic ID, that's fine. IPI, write ICR, read apic. Unsafe on basically everything, which is good. EOI, disable timer, unsafe drop. Unsafe init, and then here, anywhere that we have an unsafe scope, we can get rid of. Okay, got some unsafe here. Got some unsafe here. Nice, that will save a little bit on that. Unsafe here. Uh, software enable the APIC. Program the core's ID. Good. So now, nice. Now we have module level documentation on that. Okay. Interrupts. Everything looks pretty good here. All regs, that's easy. IDT entry, good. Interrupt frame. Interrupts, dispatch routines. Documentation for these, nice. Table pointer, good. TSS, good. Interrupt handlers, let's add that, that's new. So first this is um, module to provide, uh, module to provide uh, programming and use of interrupts on x86 processors. Tuning EOIs, dispatch. What else? Didn't we have something that was undocumented? What was undocumented? Int handlers. Ah, a table containing all of the raw pointers, all of the raw entry points for the interrupts on the system. Uh, we have to have a different entry point for every interrupt as x86 does not provide a mechanism to get the interrupt number. Thus, 
we generate new code for each interrupt handler, which uh, assigns the interrupt number to a uh, fixed register, which is then passed to a generic routine. There you go. And that should be on a new line. And we'll reformat this uh, set text width is 79. And reformat that. Perfect. Okay, so now that should be documented. Good. Much better. Uh, and all of these we won't have documents for. <laughs> Interrupt dispatch. Good. Okay. Boom. Intrinsics. Kernel source intrinsics. And this uh, implements intrinsics required uh, for MSVC uh, targets. Uh, since we build our kernel as a PE, uh, as an MSVC target, uh, it's required that we implement some of these intrinsics. In this case, we only have one, but we might end up with more. Cool. MM, wow. So this is, uh, contains the, uh, this is the virtual and physical memory manager for the kernel. And freeless node, beautiful. Oh, significantly, oh, look at that, nice. Opt alloc. Uh, this is uh, a alloc implementation, a uh, which simply wraps the result in an option such that we can uh, perform, well, this is the actual um, virtual memory allocation implementation uh, performs a virtual memory allocation uh, using uh, a new virtual address and constructed with new pages uh, returns none if the allocation failed. Otherwise, it returns an a pointer to the base of the allocation. Okay. Those automatically will get commented. This is the um, out of memory handler. We just panic. It's everything except uh, page free list. And this is Yeah, this is going to uh, create a mutable reference to a free list node uh, from a raw physical address. This will make sure the physical address is inside of our physical memory map. Okay, and this is a free list, free page list. Um, and this is a, a free list structure for holding all of the freed pages, uh, physical, four kilobytes in size, four kilobyte aligned uh, pages on the system. This is create a new empty free list. This is a physical address of the first entry in the free list. Get a page from the free list. That's all documented well. This is going to um, put a page back onto the free list. It's up to the caller to make sure the page is uh, four kilobyte in size and four kilobytes aligned. Wrap around physical memory. Perfect. So that's all documented. Panic, panic's easy. 
uh, panic handlers and soft reboot for the kernel. Looks good. Print macro support. Uh, yeah, we'll go into kernel source print. And we'll say print macro support. Stylize that a little bit better. Kernel print, and this is um, uh, generic, or this is uh, serial port formatted printing. You had a typo in the intrinsics docs. Okay, I will go back to that. Uh, entry point. Well, that's for the straight, straight for the kernel. Core. Okay. Kernel source main. And this is the entry point of the kernel. Intrinsics for MSVC targets since we are a kernel. Since we build our kernel as a PE, as an MSVC target, it's required that we implement some of these intrinsics. Okay, cargo clean. Well, yeah, everything's documented at this point. And this is, um, this is a kernel written all in Rust. Cargo doc, that should update, refine. Uh, cargo clean, get status, get commit am, um, bootloader, or kernel in a good initial uh, state seems pretty resilient to corruption and supports soft reboots in almost any situation. Hit push. So that is now up on the project GitHub. Woo! In this exact state. And let's just make sure it's working on all of our machines. Oh my god, I fucking broke it. <laughs> Get commits and uh, uh, silly fix. Get push. Cargo run clean. Cargo run. Uh, cargo run clean. Cargo clean. Cargo run. So this will build everything, all the different stages, and that works. Okay. History C, cargo run. And let's try it on here. We got soft reboots working here. No problem. Soft reboots on physical hardware working just fine. And let's get this back up. I'm going to reboot these machines so they get the latest bootloader. Okay. Remote control, power control, reset server. Yeah, we have NUMA support, X, uh, X2 APIC support, APIC support. We'll bias allocations towards the NUMA nodes of their individual processors, so we'll get their fastest allocations. Uh, we've tested that this works on machines with 256 cores, which a lot of kernels will not support. Um, so yeah, that's all shipped up. I think it's finally time to write the network driver. I can't believe it. I can't believe we've finally gotten here. I mean, I can. I'm not too surprised. So we're waiting for these to come up physically. I'm just going to do a couple tests on them. So we'll make sure they can soft reboot in the halted state, in the panic state, and that they can panic from different cores as well. So we just want to make sure the full set of those works. If I scroll here, you'll see the panic reason. 
soft reboot requested from timer, and then that just immediately resets. Okay, 256 cores, no problem. All cores online, great. Four cores, no problem. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna try a panic, died, and this is going to panic on all the cores, which is actually gonna be interesting. Panicked on another core, let's try this, reboot. We recover, no problem. Can recover on both of those. Um, next, I'm going to say if core ID is zero, we're going to only panic on the on the main core. Okay. And we can recover from that. Uh, so we can recover from a panic on the local core. We can recover from a halt. We can recover from a panic on a remote core. I think we're bulletproof. <laughs> Hell yeah. Super stable. All right. Let's write a fucking network driver, guys. Let's go. It's happening. We're doing it. We've made it. We finally made it to the network code. The network code is the last thing that we have to implement before we can go and... Uh, it's the last code that we have to implement before we can just go on and start working on fuzzing stuff. So we're, this is, to me, feeling like we're about four hours from probably being able to start work on fuzzing stuff. What car are you writing a driver for? We're gonna do an E1000. Um, <laughs> fuck yeah. All right, uh, kernel of source. I'm probably gonna do a PCI device thing yeah, so let me go into kernel source panic. Make sure this is clear and soft reboot. Destroy the core locals. This will drop anything we've initialized for this core, like the 8-bit, causing it to get reset to the original boot state. Perfect. It's exactly what we want. Um, perform the soft reboot. But yeah, so now we can test this on real physical hardware. So I'm going to write something that will enumerate PCI space. So we'll start off with that. We'll make a new module, kernel source PCI.rs. And this is going to be mod PCI. And then if core ID is zero, uh, here we'll um, here we'll say initialize PCI devices, and then we'll do unsafe PCI in it. Oops. Uh, this is a uh, handler for PCI-based devices. Um, and we'll, we'll probably add more to that as we expand this. So we'll do pub unsafe fn init. This will uh, enumerate, enumerate all PCI devices on the system and uh, initialize drivers for any supported devices. Okay, so to do this uh, is relatively simple. We're gonna write something that's gonna dump out the PCI device mapping table. And honestly, we can probably get the, um, I'm gonna actually bake into the kernel the uh, PCI vid did table. I think, yeah, the PCI ID repository. So what we can do is we can actually grab this and let's see how big this is, but I don't think it's that large. We can bake this into our, um, we can bake this into our kernel and then we'll be able to print, uh, I've never had this before, but we'll be able to print the pretty print string for the PCI devices. You guys wanna, wanna do that? Uh, walked into my room, heard some exclamation, what's happened? So basically, we pushed up to the repo, and if anyone's not familiar, the repo can be found at Project. Um, we've pushed up everything, so we went and documented basically everything. Uh, Napalm, you're probably not familiar with, um, Rust documentation, but when you do these document comments, they're all, um, it's just markdown. So I can go into the kernel, and I can do cargo doc open and that will document everything and pop open a browser and I have everything documented based on the comments that I put in the code so I can go through and what we've did is we made sure 
that every single thing that we have has a document comment. So every single thing in here has a meaningful comment of what it does, what it is, except for these interrupt handlers because there's 256 of them and they all do the same thing. But yeah, pretty print aligns uh, with the other debug features of the kernel. Yeah, absolutely. So, so anyways, we got all that documentation shipped up and uh, get status. Let's see if, ooh, uh, let's go into kernel, then get ignore slash target, uh, get status. So get add, get ignore. So we're gonna add ignores to the kernel and the bootloader so that if people do document that uh, those will get, those folders will not be included because it will like build the documentation. So we'll grab the get ignore from the kernel. Okay. Get add bootloader, get ignore, get status. Okay, cargo run clean, cargo run, okay. Nice. I did the pretty print with Linux uh, PCI IDs database before. Make sure you output your PCI device classes as well. Yeah, so what I'll do, so what we have to do for PCI, it's actually really easy. Um, PCI, there are a couple input output ports that we can enumerate to find all of the devices on the system. And so what you use is, um, you basically can set up this number with register offset function number, device number, bus number, and you can enumerate all of these possible combinations going down the list. Um, and you can just check whether or not that device is present. And if it is present, um, then you know that that device is present. So we're basically gonna enumerate the entire space here. Uh, and if I remember correctly, if nothing is present on the, I think everything is zero index. So if nothing is present on a bus, you can skip it. So it's not like we're brute forcing a 24 bit number here. If there's nothing on the bus, then we just skip and go to the next bus. So you end up only enumerating kind of the, the core uh, of what's there. But this is where the bus number, device number, function number, register number. So the bus is the actual bus that the device is on. The device is the unique number on that bus. The function number is the unique function of that device. Say you had a PCI card that implemented kind of two different features, they would get different function numbers. And then the register offset is to actually register, uh, access the registers of the device. In this case, we don't actually care about that. Um, so we're gonna ignore that. But what you do is you write out the address to CF8 uh, that will allow you to uh, program the address. It kind of it uses this windowing model, which is the same thing we saw in the IO APIC. So we'll write the address we want to index, and then we'll read the value that we get back. And what we'll want to do, this has the enable bit, which tells you whether or not you're actually enabling that address. And this gives us a window into kind of the, the first part of the PCI device structure, which is this. So the offset, uh, actually, does it use the register number or the offset? Register offset, yeah. So we plug in an offset and then we can read a 32-bit word back that's the vendor device ID status, all these different things. Um, gonna use the import string functions to read uh, the entire thing. Would be nice to map to the bytes to a Rust structure. Yeah, I'll probably do that. I don't think I'll use the string input functions. I'll just in it in a loop. Uh, it just reduces more complexity and um, like the performance of this just doesn't matter. <laughs> it's done once and it takes like a microsecond. So I'll just loop it and yeah, but I will probably convert this to a Rust structure for sure. Um, that is the only thing where I'm jealous of Java encoding C and C++. Javadoc is freaking neat. Seems like Rust is something similar. I would say Rust is much better um, than Java's, but yes, Rust does have one. Uh, Doxygen is pretty crap. Yeah, absolutely it is. It, it definitely, like, every time I've seen, like, Doxygen documented code, it's usually just been fucking pointless to have this, the, the Doxygen, because it's, like, it just mentions the functions, because people don't typically use them very thoroughly. Rust has a really strong culture around using document comments, uh, and I try to follow along with that culture, where I make sure that everything is set up in that way. Okay, so this table is applicable if header type is one. And where's header type? PCI device structure. If the header type is a one, 
header type here. Okay, so we want to read the header for sure, and then the rest of the stuff we'll get based on the different modes. Um, and let's see, this is a header type two, PC had a card bus. Um, class codes for all these things. All right, let's see what we get here. So first we'll enumerate the space. So we're gonna write this configuration register. So we'll uh, go through all of the buses. So that's eight bits, right? 16 to 24, that's eight bits. Uh, 11 to 16 is five bits. This is three bits. So let's, uh, I'm gonna actually just pull this up here because we'll want to be able to read this pretty quickly. Okay, so in init, uh, and I need to implement shared CPU source. I think I have an in in eight and an out eight, but I don't have an in 32 and right out 32, which we'll be using in this case. So write output val 16, 16, a 16 bit value, a an eight bit value, okay. In this case, anywhere there's an eight, we'll replace it. Oh, this is a 32-bit. Val, so U32, Val will go into EAX. This will take an EAX. This will take an EAX. Let's take a U32. Oops. Returns a U32, U32, 32-bit, EAX. All right, I think we fixed all of those up correctly. So now what we can do is for bus in 0 0.256, for device in 0 dot uh, so there are 256 devices, six, two, two to the six is, right, this is six, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, no, that's five. Yeah, that's five. So two to the f fifth is 32. For function in zero to uh, eight, nine, 10, three bits, so that's eight. All right. The address argument to out 32 is u16. Yes, that is correct. So all the addresses for in and outs are always 16 bits. I think you can use eight bits, but they don't exceed 16 bits and you can access an 8-bit one through a 16-bit address, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so I think what we do is, I think, I think you have to populate things in order, meaning that if we see a bus, so we're gonna, we're gonna compute the address for each level, I guess. Um, I don't think I have to go through all of them, but but we will for now. What? How big is this number actually? Uh, 256 times 32 times eight. Is that really it? Oh. Yeah. Never mind. I, I guess I don't stop at that phase. So here we're gonna make an address. Uh, compute the address to select this uh, BDF com BDF combination. And we'll do one shift 31, that's the enable bit. Or that with the bus shift by 16, or that with device shift by 11, or that with function shift by eight. Um, uh, so this has, we'll do const, um, PCI address enable U32 is one shift 31. Uh, this is the enable bit for accessing the OX. What is it? Uh, CF8 IO port. And then here we can use a named thing instead of a wacky constant. So then we'll do a CPU out32 to OXCF8 
Oh, we should const that too. Const uh, PCI config address U32 U16 is OXCF8. And this is the IO port for the PCI uh, address window. And this is the IO port for the PCI. Um, a PCI device window address. Yeah. Uh, configuration space window address. I'll port for the configuration space window data. This is CFC, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And this is PCI config data. And we'll write to PCI config address. We'll write the address. So this will um, select the address. And then what do we want to check here? Um, blah, blah, blah. And FFFF will be in is the invalid that is returned on read accesses to the configuration space registers of non-existent. Okay, so that's what we care about. So we'll write and we'll say we want to get the device vendor ID um, to read the device and vendor ID. And then here we'll say let vendor ID is equal to uh, let did vid is equal to um, CPU in 32 from the PCI config data. Uh, select the address and read the device vendor ID. The vendor ID will be equal to uh, did vid as u16. And then the device ID will be that shift by 16. So I'll extract the right bit. So this will extract uh, the vendor and device ID. And now I can print those. 04x colon 04x vendor ID device ID. In 32, in, in 32. Okay, so we should be able to run this, and we get a list. It's a lot of Fs. A lot of Fs. And it's still printing Fs. Cool. So now what we're going to say is if vendor ID is equal to not zero and device ID is equal to not zero, um, continue. We'll say if the device is not present, the vid and did will be... Uh, all Fs, thus we can skip to the next device. So now this will only print the valid devices. Here we go. Those are all the devices. Here you see a lot of 8086s. These are Intel devices. Uh, 1AF4, I don't know what that one is, but we can see all of the uh, vid dids for all of the devices on the system. So that's pretty straightforward. And this will say uh, for each bus, uh, possible bus ID for each possible device ID for each possible function ID. And then we can print the bus device uh, bus device function. So now I'll have that information as well. It, this won't format very well. Uh, it happened to because they were all one bytes, but this shows you where those things are on the system. So we're going to grab these PCI IDs. Yeah, these were updated literally today. Um, so cool. So cool. Oh, and cubed is kind of big. Not in this case. <laughs> it's, only, it's only 64K. 64k iterations, 
pretty, pretty light, to be honest. All right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write a parser for the PCI IDs. Is the comparison with equals not zero a Rust style guide thing or a personal thing? Um, I just typically do that when I want all Fs. So if you're not familiar, not zero, the, the bang zero, that's equal to uh, tilde zero in most other languages. It's the ones complement, so it's just all Fs. That's typically what I do. Um, for 16-bit things, yeah, it doesn't really matter. For 64-bit things, it starts to get to be a lot of Fs to type out. So I'm just really used to that because most of the time I'm dealing with 64-bit values. Um, I actually really like this style. In this case, you could maybe make a case for saying just using Fs so it's a little bit more uh, explicit. Um, and I think I agree with that here because they are uh, short, they fit in one line. It's a little bit more obvious what's going on. So I do think in this one specific case, I think it is uh, strictly just better to do it this way. So thanks for that. Okay, so we're gonna write a parser for the PCI IDs database. Um, so basically, pounds or comments. Uh, Safe net wrong ID. So vendor vendor name, device device name, sub vendor. So these are tabs. What is a sub vendor? Is that something I get out of these spaces? Subsystem vendor ID, ah, I see. So let's try and find an example of that. I see. That will have the specific information there. So yeah, that's for the sub, sub vendor, sub device, subsystem name. Okay, cool. So that's only gonna happen if the if the header type is zero zero hex. Um, I think I will parse this structure, this whole thing. I'll probably read this whole thing into a Rust structure. So we'll do a um, repr c, and this will be everything's packed here. Struct PCI device. And this is only for devices, correct? Yeah, and we'll also represent the header. Struct PCI header. And this is the um, common PCI header for the PCI configuration space of any device. Of any device. Um, uh, or bridge. Yeah, we'll say that. So then we'll have device ID, U30, uh, U16. Oh, it's actually vendor ID, U16, followed by the device ID. So this is the uh, vendor ID of the uh, device. Device ID of the device, pretty obvious. Um, then we have the status. This is the status of the device, or actually command. You know what? I think for things that are defined by a standard, I'm not going to docu comment them. It's just too verbose. Uh, revision, prog if, subclass, class, uh, cache line, uh, cache line size, I guess we can do this. Latency, timer, header type, bist. So that's the header. Okay, and then we'll uh, drive clone copy debug. And this will start with a header, PCI header, clone copy debug, repr C. And this is a um, 
uh, configuration space. Um, I think tilde would be more expression. So you're juggling bits rather than Boolean values. As uh, it, the exclamation point is not logical negation in Rust. Well, it's it's both. It's both logical negation and um, uh, Boolean one's complement, depending on where you're using it. So, configuration space uh, for a PCI device. So I'll have the uh, standard uh, PCI configuration space header. Then we'll have the bars, drop some bars. Bar zero, U32 for all of these for five bars. One, two, three, four, five. A uh, card. Bus sys pointer. Okay. Then we'll have a subsystem uh, vendor ID. U16 subsystem ID. Is that the device subsystem? Yeah, we'll see. Device ID for the subsystem uh, expansion ROM address. So this is where the op ROM goes. Uh, capabilities U8 reserved zero U8 uh, U8 for seven. Interrupt line interrupt pin min grant. Max latency. Okay. I guess we'll put these here. And then we'll grab this. Steal this. Paste. Bah. Paste, paste, paste. Okay, there we go. Um, uh, read the entire configuration space, uh, or read the PCI configuration header. So let's header is equal to an OU8 four. Um. Um, this is size of PCI header, and we'll pull in use core mem size of, pull that in, 85, so we got the header, so we will read, actually these will be U32s, for this divided by 4, 4, uh, this is for register in zero dot dot header dot len. We will uh, write an address or register times size of u32. Um, set the window to the register we want to read. This will be a size of U32. Then we'll read the value uh, and read the value. Then we'll place that at register is equal to this. Um, RID register in Header dot iter mute dot enumerate. This will have the register ID. Okay. So I'll read all of those. 
uh, RID in this case, that's U32. That needs to be mute. And then we'll convert the header. That header is equal to a unsafe, unfortunately, because we have to do this in Rust. Uh, core pointer read on aligned of header as pointer as const PCI header. So, I really wish Rust had safe transmutes for this, and this is uh, convert the header to our PCI header structure. Now I should be able to do this. Print header. Uh, hex question mark. Okay, this should work. Oh, we're already in unsafe. Read on the lines. Oh, and this header is equal to this. Okay, so we didn't fit. Fuck. We'll go with this style. And this will be a PCI header. When I do cast, I like to strongly type everything just to make sure we don't fuck anything up. Because uh, you are playing with risky stuff here. All right. So now we read all of the headers. They do look valid. And then we have the header type. Uh, if header type, what did I call it? Header type? Yeah. Is equal to zero. It's not equal to zero. Uh, continue. And this is a uh, skip bridge, uh, skip non device PCI uh, entries. Skips things like PCI bridges. Okay. Now, print the header, and now what we're gonna do is we can actually read the whole thing. Um, we can do the same thing. This is gonna read it into a, uh, read the PCI configuration header for a device. Yeah. Read the PCI configuration. This is gonna be your device, PCI device. Um, okay, device, header, device, device. I could have found it, I could have done a find and replace there. Now I can print this whole thing. And that's not just the header, so this is only for the devices on the system. And there we go. Now we have the capabilities, we have their bars, and those do look correct. The interrupt pin, the interrupt line that that delivers interrupts to. Beautiful. All right. Um, make your scripts, see these scripts, Vim. Uh, uh, PCI ID to rust.py and this will um, convert the most recent PCI ID database PCI ID database to rust code for us to use in our kernel. We're doing this in Python because there's just no reason to do it in anything else. Um, okay, so we'll do. Uh, how do I how do I download a file in Python again? There's like a bunch of different libs. The request is a third-party lib, but there's HTTP lib or something like that. Let's look at the Python three source. HTTP lib two. Um, here, Python 3, download HTTP. No, that's not what I wanted. I didn't want the actual download of Python. Uh, here we go. HTTP, HTTP, 
statuses. I don't care about that. Client. Connection. It's got to be like, uh, just go do it. I'd stick with requests. Yeah, the thing is, I just don't want to... I don't want to add a dependency for uh, for requests. But I do think requests might be the better play here. Um, Python 3 download whole file. Python 3, nice. God damn, eight years ago. Eight years ago, people were doing fucking Python 3. Oh, URL lib. That's what I was thinking. We'll do that. We'll grab this. We'll grab this. And then we'll grab this. Eight. Uh, print data. Python PCI ID to Rust. Okay. Why does that pull that in and not use it? See you around, jump out. Wait, what? What? The fuck? Is this... Oh, I need to... But I tried doing this. Right? Python 3. Okay, Python 3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that downloads that file, and then we're going to parse it. And you should probably cache it locally. But let's just do the parser perfectly first try. Um, version and date. So what we'll do is uh, version is equal to re dot match. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pull it down locally. Um, let me get this. Okay. Data is equal to open PCI IDs read. Print the data. Python. Uh, Python 3 PCI. Okay. We'll just open it here. E scripts. Okay. So then we will do an re dot match. Actually, re dot find all lines containing white space, one or more white space, followed by a date, one or more white space, uh, zero through nine. An actual hyphen, a single space, or a colon. One or more of those bad boys. And print that. Fuck. You don't have to escape pluses. Oh, yeah, that is the problem. Okay, perfect. So this is the, um, 
let date oh, date do so this assert len date is zero uh, one great okay and now I want to parse uh, for line in data dot split lines print line I think it's split underlines or split lines is one word because it's Python all right if line starts with this continue skip comments wow we're so good and then are these vid did what are the what are these at the end Those are Oh, these are the um these are the uh classes. Okay. Okay, so we're going to ignore that for now and we're going to say honestly we can just do this. re. match match the line with a vendor which is a zero through nine, a through F for those two spaces, then a name for the rest of the line. And this is off of line and we'll get, let's return some match object, right? Nice. So then I can get, can I just to, do a list on a match object? Mm. Uh, this is device is equal to if uh, if not device, continue, print device. I should be able to list a device, I think. I think if I can do list on that. Nope, you can't? What is it, device dot? I know there's group to like get a specific group, but I want kind of all the groups. Aha, groups. So we'll have the vendor ID vendor name is equal to this. Okay. Um, so I'll say if device do this, this is, oh, that's vendor. So for a vendor, we'll do that. Uh, S vendor device. This is for a device, which will have a single tab device and two spaces in a device name. Okay. Next, uh, sub device. So this will have one of those, one of these, two of those. So we'll have sub vendev. Uh, this will be sub vendev. This will have the sub device name, sub device ID, and the sub device uh, vendor. All right, vendor device, blah, blah, blah. Print K. 
Okay, so that I think will work. And I guess, oh, that's two tabs. Print device groups, vendor groups. Yeah, I think this needs to be a stateful parser. Nevertheless, yep, that's a sub device. We have vendors working. Okay, this does look like it's working. Um, I mean, I can literally just store the vendor. Yeah, how do I want to organize this in Rust? And you can't you can't statically make a hash table in Rust, can you? Which is kind of annoying. If vendor colon equals are a match, ooh, I don't know if I'm on Python three eight. Yeah, Python three seven here. Um, so how am I going to do this? Because you can't Rust static dict or const. Drops hash map. Yeah, I don't think you can do constant hash maps in Rust. Um, so I think we'll just generate code that will make one. Unfortunately, I think I think that's kind of the only way we can do it. What's up, Cowtel? How are you doing? Just Debian things. Hell yeah. I use macros to generate a lookup, generate lookups tables in the past. Yeah, so I'll probably use this to make tables. So we'll do like print. Let uh, vendors is a hash map of a vendors is equal to a hash map of a U16 to a static string is hash map or B tree map new. B tree map, okay. Vendors, devices. And this will have. Um, so that would index by vendor ID. The device ID is per vendor. So we'll need to, we'll need to have this heavy vector of devices, I think. Doing well, learning Godot. How's that going? Um, so I have a device name, print. There we go. Vendors is this. Uh, struct vendor. This will have a vendor ID, name of the vendor, and a and devices that that vendor has. And how does that look for sub devices? 1C01, and then there's a 1C04. So they'll have a B-tree map of that vendor's devices to the device name. But then I guess that device... Okay. I'll have a struct device, device ID, U16, name of the device and then sub devices 
And then in this, we'll have a B tree map of the, I guess apparently the vendor sub, sub device into a static stir. I think that's all the information that we can possibly get. Let me vendors is equal to this contains a vendor. All right. So now what I can do is uh curve vendor is equal to none. Curve vendor is equal to vendor ID int 16 um and then we'll do a print vendors dot insert at vendor ID a vendor structure which will contain device uh, vendor ID uh, here we can just say ID same for this okay so I have a vendor ID which will have ID uh, can you do pound X in this? Let me see if I can Let's see what that prints. Oh, and got to start and end that. Well, we can just start it. No format code X, because that's not int. Vendor ID is equal to int vendor ID 16. Then this, we can just assign it. There we go. Assign that there. Blah, blah, blah. So we have an ID. Um... name which will be put some little quotes in here and our name and I don't know if we're gonna have to escape things for this to be valid rust I don't know if there's gonna be any like slashes or something in here but I doubt it and then we have devices, none. Uh, actually, devices is equal to B tree map new. Put that on a new line. And we'll close it. That looks like shit, but whatever. Oh yeah, Python does that shit, doesn't it? Wait, how do you make... How do you, how do you have it not include the first part of the next line in a multi-line string in Python? There's gotta be a way, right? Because this looks like shit. Rust does it so much better. And string escape. String literals. Oh, can you just requote it? You can concatenate them. It's gross. But yeah, if we have to. Um, oh, you can do that. Okay. So, vendor ID, ID, name, device, uh, 
So put some spaces on those. And then put a space here. And this should look nice. Okay, that looks great. Probably want to get rid of the dot. Quote dot. Where do I have that? I don't think I have one. The quote after devices. Hmm. I think this is working as I expect. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Thank you. Um, this. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, ID name, devices, btree map new, and that should be valid rust. And then we have kind of a state machine here. And the state machine, basically that'll latch the current vendor. So when we get to a device, we will do print... Format. This is vendors. Um, for the current vendor, is this. Let's see, that should succeed, right? It does. Dot devices.inserts and this will be device ID uh, vendor device curve vendor then we're going to insert device ID here comma so that's close Inserting devices, and then we want the device. Device ID, device ID X, comma, name, which is quote, device name, comma, F doesn't really matter. It's just on the Python side of shit. Actually, we want that to be here. Device sub devices B tree map new close semicolon on that. Same with that semicolon on that. Uh, close those and open these. Okay, insert vendor ID, let's see a device. For this vendor, get the devices, insert this device with this ID and with that name. Okay, uh, cur device is equal to device ID, cur device is none. And here, SDV, uh, sub ven is equal to int sub device vendor 16 sub did device ID is equal to int sub vendor ID. Now we do this for the devices for cur device. dot sub devices dot insert um and here we want to do the sub then sub did Insert the name uh, 
Okay. This. F. God, this is fucking gross. <laughs> uh, then we're going to insert the quote sub device name end quote and the insert close the quote put a semi um cur device pound x okay We're getting to close the insert method call. On this one. And this one. Okay. And then we'll print. Uh, this will be fn create Uh, pub fn create That's B tree map that's gonna cause a lot of allocations Ugh. For all those map all those empty maps Yeah, I might want to be able to do none for some of those because it's just going to be so, so many empty maps. So this is create device um, or load device database. Do all this shit. Print. The kernel's a 1% code, 99% PCI mappings. Yeah. To be honest, I don't need this at all. It's just kind of cool to have. I kind of think it'd be fun. Uh, this will probably just have as a something you like can or can or cannot include or something like that. But we'll we'll see how much this is because uh, first of all, let's see if this is actual Rust. Test.rs Rust C test.rs. Okay, um, we're not closing some string. Oh, one of these contains a quote. Monster sound. If I got an old device names, always had the like craziest fucking things. How are y'all doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Having a blast. Uh, we need to, I don't know. Is this really worth the time? No, it's not. This is, we're not, we're not doing this. Um. We're not, we're not doing that. I looked at the clock and I saw that we've already spent 30 minutes on this and we spent another like 20 to 30 minutes. It's not worth it. Uh, we're just going to go and... Um, we're going to go and add a network card. We're going to switch this to an E1000. This is going to kill our, yeah, our iPixie is broken now. So we have to build a new iPixie. Uh, that should be pretty easy. Um, how do you do this? Grab pie, pixie. Please, 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 please. Fuck yeah. <laughs> e1000 net dot disk. Um, eighty eighty six thousand e. Uh, 
I picked you targets. I think no dash net. Oh. Is there an E1000? No. Is it 8086-1000E? And do we have one of those? Do we have an 8086-1000E? Well, we made a disc, so we'll just, we'll just try it. Floppy browse. Uh, mm. 1000E. No, it's just 100E. This is correct. But what's going on with my... Uh, oh, it, it worked. Okay. Eventually... Wow, this is really struggling... Is it because this just has so many files in it? It's just like really unoptimized and it struggles with that many file names. 8086, 1000 E. Browse local. Uh, Was this iPixie? Source bin E one thousand E. What? Oh, eighty eighty six one thousand E. Disk apply. All right, we did it. Okay, I have no idea why this is like so broken. Reset. Uh, scroll to the end. On the reset. Okay. There's the 8086-1000E. Nice. So, and let's see what I physically have. Oh, boy. Uh, we'll print these in a more condensed view. We'll print the device... Device, uh, device ID, the vendor ID. So this is on real hardware. Um, yeah. Why did that look wrong? Okay. O six, O six. Oh. Header. Boo. Okay. And let's put a colon there so it's actually readable. So this is on real hardware. Um oh this is on this is on the Phi. So the Phi this will have a one of these will be an X540. Uh, PCI device list database. The repo, let's get that. Devices. No, I just want the, I just want, here we go. So, X540 is a 1515. Did I take that out of the file land? No. What? What? Now that definitely has a... All right, 1528, let's see. 
X540, ah, oh, X540 AT2. Okay, that's what we got. Oh, and we can print the sub vendor information too. Um, device sub vendor ID, sub vendor and sub device or something, subsystem. Subsystem device ID. Now we'll get the full whack. Uh, oh, 06. I'm so used to typing 16x. Alright. So now we can see that we indeed have an 886002. There we go, we've got a Converged Network Adapter X540-T1. Okay, and then this other machine, what does this have? I don't have a NIC plugged into here, so it's 1533. Uh, an I210. Okay. Um, and the T1, T2. I'm pretty sure this will be the same as an E1000, effectively. So three network drivers, just one. It's all the same device. E1000 covers everything. They'll have like slightly different features, but the, the core is gonna be the same. Um, spec data sheet. So this is for the I210. We don't need this anymore. We don't need this or that. So this is for the I210. Uh, and we'll see that they're pretty much all the same at the end of the day. Um, so this is the PCI space. I'm going to hit the head. I'll, I'll be right back. Okay, um, Kali Linux, right? No, this is just Debian. I don't think I've ever used Kali, actually. I might have used Backtrack back in high school, but I've never used Kali. Intel has different drivers for the i210 and the E1000E. Yeah, but they'll be, they'll, oh, shit. Okay, well, I do like this uh, website because it does kind of show 82575, 82576, uh, and these, I210, base gigabit, and then the E1000E and the E1000. So the E1000 is not PCI Express. The E1000E is PCI Express. 
the IGB are for these. Uh, now I'm pretty sure they're still all the same. <laughs> So, we got an I-210. That's what we physically have, right? That's what we have there. And then what is a... A 10 OE. What is that? Eighty eighty six. Ugh. We're gonna have to go to Intel. 86 space space Intel uh, 10 e em all right so let's this is the one that basically everyone emulates um, spec. Okay. Oh, this is old. Luckily, is this actually what I want? PCI features, blah, blah, blah. Offloading shit. This is for physical stuff. I feel like this doesn't have the software side of things. There's the architecture, kind of cool. Yeah, that doesn't seem to have it. Data sheet. Let's find it. What's this? This E squared prom. Yeah, so that's But yeah, this doesn't seem to have any description of the software side of things. I'm going to have to find this software. Got a link here. See what this is. Yeah, this looks good. Eight to five forty EM. There we go. Thank you. All right. So what we care about is how do these differ? And I'm pretty sure I can implement the same driver, I think. Um, PCI local bus interface. So this is how we configure it. Here's that. Here's everything that we saw, right? And then this shows the did vid eighty eighty six. Blah blah blah. Okay. So we've got a bar. Bar zero. Okay, so we have a 64-bit address. Nice. 32-bit bars. PCI X mode bar 32-bit in the EEPROM set to zero. PCI X mode. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is just PCI mode. Let's 
do I have to check the E squared problem first to know that? But how do I? Second PDF has a PCIe version. There, they'll all be the same. Oh, type. Yeah, the type tells you if it's 64-bit or not. Zero for mem, one for IO, yep. And then zero, zero for 32, 10 for 64 bits. Then we have the address of the bar. That's really all we care about. So let's take a look. Um, Remember memory writes. All right, bursts, not stuff that I care about. Let's find the register descriptions. So these registers will likely be pointed to by the bar. Internal registers and memories can be accessed as direct DMA, uh, direct memory mapped offsets from the bar or bar zero, bar one, depending on that configuration. Uh, and that's really all we care about. And then this is IO mapped. So this allows you to do IO to access those things, but we're not gonna do that. We're only gonna use the memory map, so that's all we care about. Um, okay, here are the registers. So this should be relatively simple. Oh yeah, I remember doing all this shit. Okay, um, this is really all I care about. Uh, so I care about reset, so Register conventions, blah, blah, blah. Main register descriptions. And one of these will just have a reset method, I'm pretty sure, that'll put it in a normalized state. Um, device reset. One, self-clearing. If set, globally, globally resets the entire Ethernet controller with the exception of the PCI configuration registers. All registers and state machines are set to their power on reset values. It's equivalent to a PCI respect, reset, uh, with one exception being that the PCI configuration registers are not reset. Okay, so that's bit 26. Let's check on this one. What do we got here? Register map. Uh, that's for the PCI. Programming interface, here we go. General register descriptions. And we'll see that this will have probably the exact same layout. Here's the register summary, right? So if we go side by side, we'll send these to three. And we can close this. And we can close that. And we'll split this on the side. So here are the two different ones. Okay. And they'll probably line up control status, um, arty ball. Maybe they do change them quite a bit. Oh yeah, that's at a different location. Shit. What's the driver for? This is for uh, network cards. <clears throat> okay, so... Well, we can probably do both at the same time if we just are cautious about the offsets of these things. So I think they'll use the same structures. So this is for the receive descriptor, uh, base low Q. And we've got the descriptor here, and then we have the length here, RX, des RX descriptor head, tail. So those are all kind of right next to each other. Um, absolute delay timer, not applicable to the 82.544, okay. Then we have the transmit descriptors, um, and then this supports multiple queues. So this one probably only has one queue that you have to share. This one has multiple queues, so you can potentially have multiple lists. Um, I actually do uh, 
I typically do um, it. So on the X five forties that I run in all my machines, they have sixty four. I think. Yeah, I think it's sixty four uh, queues. So I actually assign one queue to each core, and then cores don't because it's a sixty four core machine. And then that way the cores don't have to get a lock to access the queues. They can just all they all have their own. Basically, they all have their own, like, independent network cards. We're going to have to support muxing of those because that's going to be uh, something we're going to commonly see. So we'll want to implement something that can kind of handle both here. So we care about how these descriptors look. Do you require a network driver to be high performance? It has to be able to saturate gigabit with UDP, which is pretty easy. Gigabit's really easy. Um, it's pretty... It's, it's pretty hard to not be able to hit gigabit speeds because it's pretty slow. Uh, I would say it starts to get difficult once you get to... Once you get to like 3 plus gigabit is when it starts to get difficult. I would say. <clears throat> like once once you want to go more than 3 gigabit, you're either going to have to use jumbo frames or you're going to have to use offloads. So we're probably going to do... Um, we're just going to implement it pretty naively because uh, we're going to implement a UDP and IP stack that are agnostic to whatever hardware you have. Uh, that way, for some of these devices that don't have offload, I think the, the DEC chip that Hyper-V has as their soft network card, I think it's a 100 megabit network card, and I don't think it has any offload. So we'll want to implement everything here to allow for offload, and or we'll want to implement everything here to not do any offload, so it'll be a very naive at the start, and then we'll slowly make it more and more device-specific and using some of those uh, TCP and UDP offload uh, features. But right now, I just don't really care about that. Um, to saturate gigabit is going to be a joke on a single core. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, I don't eat my words on that, but it's only, um, what is gigabit? Uh, 125 megabytes per second. Uh, so you basically need to be able to do about a thousand or a hundred thousand UDP packets per second, which is really not that much. I think my X540, my old Rust UDP stack, I think could do like four to five million UDP packets per second, and that one could basically saturate 10 gigabit uh, on a UDP stack, and that was without using offloads as well. So, or I guess, yeah, that was running like four or five gigabit, I think. So if I use jumbo frames, I could saturate. But not with those tiny, tiny normal frames. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna just write the we're gonna write the the driver for the E1000, uh, the one that comes uh, with uh, KVM. We're gonna get that one done, and then we'll see if we can make it a, a little bit more generic between the two, uh, which I'm pretty sure we'll be able to do. So the first thing that we're gonna have to do is we're gonna implement um, device registration here. So. I don't necessarily know how I want to do it yet, so I'm just going to hard code it here. I'm going to just say, um, uh, uh, const devices, I think. Mm. What we're going to do is we're going to call, we're going to call all the drivers and we're going to present them with this uh, PCI device structure. And we'll make all these fields pub then. Uh, replace uh, start of line followed by four characters with a one, two, three, four pub space. Do the same here. Make all of these public. Oops. Okay. And we'll make this pub and this pub. And then we'll basically present these to all the possible devices we can have. Um, and we'll have, we'll have just a driver structure. Thanks for all the follows, everyone. Follows are always where it's at. It's so nice to see 100 people here hanging out. 
having fun. My, uh, my North American crowd isn't as big as my European crowd, which is kind of weird, because I'm North American, but I've been streaming mainly in EU times. <laughs> uh, const device. Uh, we'll say drivers. And this will have a list of all driver uh, probe routines on the system. And I think what we'll do here is we'll have, this will be a list of maybe something that implements PCI device. Struct PCI device. Well, we already have one of those, but um, I could do like a trait device or something like that, or like PCI device, whatever. And this could have a like probe, and then we pass this a uh, device, and this would have a PCI device, which is the info. Ooh, so many follows! Hell yeah! We're on a follow train. Uh, this probe will return a self, I think. I might actually use an any trait. Um, I think that's what I might do. So I'm gonna have a list of all things that support probing. List of all devices. I can't box up a device. So I'll have something that returns um, yeah, this will be a list of functions. Uh, we'll say, uh, type probe function is equal to a function that takes a device and returns a, an any type. Probe function. Oh hell yeah, guys! Thank you so much for all the follows. Hope you're. I hope you're enjoying the random low-level development. We're gonna get into. It. We haven't done too much coding yet today, uh, but we're just about to start getting going on that. So uh, here we'll grab use core any any. Okay. So this allows me to have, I can mention all of the, I can mention all of the functions that will probe and then those will return in any type. Well, this would be a uh, box dine any, I think is what that'll have to be. Use core box box. So I, I gotta put a lot of thought into this, right? Because I don't wanna fuck this up. So there are a couple things that I have to do, uh, which is relatively difficult. One, I have to have a generic way of, of having like a list of all these drivers. And second of all, I want a way that um, I want a way that those drivers can register. So at some point, I'm gonna wanna be able to like something send UDP, right? And I wanna get a network device. So I'll need like a get net device. And I want this to be relatively performant. So to do this, um, I somehow need, I'm somehow gonna need a way that I can get a network device Quickly, I guess that doesn't have to be super fast. That could go through the list of all devices. We're gonna also make a read writer lock as well because we want uh, we want to be able to access these. Yeah, so I think what we'll have we we'll have this probe function here. Um, this is the type used for PCI device probes to, uh, and this will return an option box dine any 
to attempt to uh, handle a device. Um, so then here, I guess we'll start with uh, kernel source, and what are we going to call this? What Are we going to call this E1000? We'll call it E1000 for now. Um, and I should be able to then do create E1000 uh, probe. So I'll take a function that doesn't exist. Kernel uh, source main. Okay. Yeah, we're going to try and do this in a really nice generic way. Such that. Uh, no boxed in core. Yeah, of course, that's an alloc. Okay. Not found in crate E1000E. This is going to take a use crate uh, PCI. PCI device, and then this is uh, E1000 network uh, handler, uh, E1000 Intel 1 gigabit, uh, gigabit uh, network cards, uh, network card driver. Uh, E1000 family Intel, okay, whatever. Uh, pub FN probe. This will uh, uh, called by uh, checks to see if the PCI device being probed is a device that we can handle with our driver. Return a none for now, and this will take a device. PCI device. Nice. Oh, what am I doing? Option. Box. And this is E1000. Or something. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll just say, like, Intel Gigabit or something. But we could, we could do struct E1000. 10,000. 10,000 times the power. I'll do use alloc boxed box and expected option. Okay, so we should be able to do that. Expected in any. Found an E1000. Uh huh. So this will be a box dine any. And we gotta pull that in. And that's gonna be a use core any any. There we go. Um, never constructed. Yep, and then that calls probe. List of all driver probe routines on the system. Uh, if they return some, then we uh, successfully found a driver and thus will register it in the uh, devices database. Okay. So then down at the end, we're going to go through uh, four driver in drivers. And then we'll have a up here next function. And this will be continue next function. And we'll do if let sum driver is equal to driver dot uh, device, uh, and this is going to be for for probe in driver drivers uh, found a handler. Um, go to the next uh, function during the PCI bus scan, PCI scan. Or we can say like PCI enumeration. And you know what, we want this actually.
enumeration. Okay, we'll do this. Paste. Okay. All right. Wow. So this is going to uh, attempt to find a driver for this device. Holy shit. Is this it? Print. So I'll print the devices. If that is the case, then we are getting that code executed. God damn, we're good. Uh, if device dot header dot vendor ID is equal to OX8086 and device dot header dot device ID is equal to um, OX100E return uh, we'll return a sum, else, none, um, unknown device, check if we handle this device, if we do, then we will create a driver for it, in which case, we will return an E1000, and I think if we just box new that, That'll wrap it up and we're good. Yeah. So I'll make an E1000 and we'll say uh, print found E1000 and that will return that out. Nice, found an E1000. This will just comment out. We'll say if false. Um, if debug uh, PCI devices uh, PCI device here. Okay. Const debug PCI devices bool is false. Uh, if true, verbose uh, PCI device enumeration will be written to the serial ports, uh, will be displayed. That way, if we change that, okay, Z, found E1000. So that'll go through, it'll call all the probe routines. Once it, founds one that, once it found one that handles it, it will be all done. Okay, so that's a dyne any. So then to do this, what we're gonna wanna do is, uh, this of all the driver probe routines on the system. Uh, and then we'll do static devices, vec. This is a lock cell, vec. Um, hmm, how are we going to do this? Lock cell vec, this will be dine any. Gonna probably wanna implement a trait on the devices so we can destroy them. Or implement drop. We'll implement drop on the devices. I think that's correct. So this will do a dine any. Okay, and then this will be a lock cell new vec new. This is a list of all device, uh, no, that's drivers, and this is, um, yeah, list of all devices which have, uh, been handled by a driver, in which case, uh, this is a list of all of the, uh, driver, uh, structures returned by the successful uh, probe routines from the drivers uh, list. Okay, and we gotta do use alloc vec vec lock cell, we gotta pull that in, use lock cell lock cell and that requires another type. In this case, it's gonna be a interrupt state. Okay, 
And that's going to come from core locals. Uh, use crates core locals interrupt state. Okay, 37. Doesn't have a, a size known at compile time. Oh, yeah, a uh, box dine any. Okay. No interrupt state on core locals. What? Interrupt. Lock interrupts. Lock interrupts. Lock interrupts. Okay, so now we have devices. And we can do devices dot push, well, lock dot push driver. So that easy. So that's going to push the driver. And then at the end, when we do a soft reboot, I'm going to get rid of. When I do a soft reboot, we'll want to drop on that. So let's see if we can do this. Um, this, paste, impl, drop for E1000. What's up? What's up, Ash? How you doing? FN drop takes a mute self. Print dropping E1000 device. This is not going to happen. This is never going to print in our current setup. Because we never drop devices. Cool. So then in the soft reboot code, kernel, uh, oops, SP kernel source panic, FN soft reboot. Here we're going to uh, destroy all running drivers, I guess. Okay. Dude, this is going to be so nice. Destroy all running drivers. Uh, all devices. Which are handled by uh, drivers. Okay, and then here we'll do a PCI destroy devices. We can do create PCI to destroy devices. Cool, and that doesn't exist yet. Uh, pub unsafe fn destroy devices. This will um, uh, drop all devices in the devices list, causing the uh, devices to have their drop handlers invoked. Okay, and this is really easy. We just do a devices dot lock dot oh yeah um this we actually can't necessarily can't necessarily um at this point it's possible that someone has the devices lock held and if someone has the devices lock held then And we might actually arc the devices. Arc lock cell or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll try and figure it out. Um, sorry if this is too long of a message. I'd like to thank you for making these long form videos and streams. I've been using them as both a learning and sleeping aid. Uh, it's nice. Oh man, that sucks. Uh, I've had risk uh, five for a while at university, and your videos sure have helped. I'm so glad. Yeah, the risk five stuff is really fun. We'll get back to that probably once this uh, kernel and hypervisor are complete. But here we're gonna do a devices dot shatter. Um. This will drop the devices regardless of the current device lock. Thus, 
Uh, this is very unsafe and must only be done when we're doing a soft reboot and all other cores have been disabled. So we're gonna shatter that. And then we'll do core pointer drop in place. Devices.shatter. I think that'll do the trick here. Z. Oh. Well, that's getting, that's basically panicking in a loop. Uh, attempted to take a non preemptible lock and an interrupt. Oh. Wait, what? Tempted to take a non preemptible lock and an interrupt. Um. What is going on here? Device dot shatter. We just got to see the first print. So we'll just reset this and try and get a, there we go. Z, stop. All right, now hopefully that didn't scroll off the screen. Hey, okay. Panic 37, soft reboot requested from timer. Uh, interrupts 293, starting soft reboot. Panic occurred on another core. Oh, yeah, that's old. So we got another panic at 359.30. Oh. So that's going to try and free... Yeah, what I think I'm going to probably try to do is... So the soft reboot is a really interesting condition where we're kind of like forcibly unloading devices. So what I want to do is, ideally, I can do devices.lock.clear. And that will clear the vector. So this will work right now. And we'll relax this in a bit. Um, okay, maybe it won't work. Cause that's gonna free. Yeah, cause that's gonna. Well, we're going down for a soft reboot, so we don't actually have to free anything here. Fuck. Um. What I think I'll do is. Maybe I'll implement a trait on them. Or I'll reinitialize the device. I won't be able to restore these devices to the original states. Um. I think I might have to add a trait on these. Okay, let's go through these. Let devices is equal to mute deref shatter for device in devices device dot asdf. Okay, cool. Nothing implemented for that, which is great. That's exactly what I expected. So what I'm going to need to do here is... Um, I 
I heard of you through Live Overflow's YouTube channel at the start of his Ghidra release live stream. Have you ever heard of or worked with him? Yeah, I'm familiar with him. I've never worked with him, um, but I'm familiar with his stuff, and we, we used to talk way back when, like, five or six years ago before he even, like, started his channel, which is pretty crazy. I, I never would have expected his channel to have blown up like it has. It's, it's pretty awesome. So we're going to do a box dine any plus... I should be able to have a trait on here, I think, I think, I think, I'm pretty sure I can do that. Non-auto, oh shit. Can I do ASDF which implements any, and then do this? Yes. Yes. It's dynamic something that implements ASTIF, and ASTIF has to implement any. Okay, I gotta hit the head. I'll be right back. Actually, I need to get some wine. Why am I? Why don't I have any wine right now? I'll be back. <laughs> I'm quite new to this channel. Do you guys usually ping Gamoza or do you just uh, write and pray? Uh, writing and pray usually works. <laughs> Highlighting your messages helps quite a bit. Um, sometimes if I'm in a train of thought, I won't read chat, but typically chat here doesn't move fast enough that things really scroll off the... Um, that chat scrolls off the screen by the time I look back. Okay. Ooh, this wine's good. Nice. Really good. All caps, pink, tweet at him at the same time. Yeah, just send me a woof. <laughs> just send me a woof. So this is going to be a trait for a device. Um, it has to implement the any, any trait which allows us to get it back. So this is going to be a device. Okay. And then we're going to have an unsafe FN, um, I'm going to call it purge. And this is going to be a, uh, invoked on a device when we're doing a soft reboot. This may be called from an exceptionally hostile environment, e.g. inside of a panic inside of an NMI exception. It's, um, uh, the goal of this function uh, for a driver is to attempt to reset the device to a clean state, mainly disabling uh, reset the device to a state which will not disrupt the system during the soft reboot 
process. Uh, when a soft reboot happens, uh, things like DMA and interrupts on any device should absolutely be turned off. Um, resetting the device fully in many situations is ideal. Um, the device should be set to a state that shortly after the new kernel is reloaded, the device can be reinitialized uh, reinitialized with the standard device probe process. Okay, so purge is something that people need to implement. And basically that's the like, I'm, I'm dying. I need to let you know your device is like super fucked. Please reset it if you can. Uh, and then we're also going to say here, um, this will be invoked on the device regardless of locks. Thus, uh, the device sh uh, needs to be able to handle that a previous user of the device may have been interrupted mid-use. Um, So it's, a, it's really hard to be able to implement that, but basically you need some way to not depend on hardware resources. You, you need to be able to tear this device down as, as, as well as you can. And this is a uh, uh, trait to uh, hold a device. Mm. We'll say this is an implementation of a, uh, a driver for a device. There are multiple, multiple instances of a driver for each device. The uh, driver uh, handled during the probe process. Okay. Um, so that's going to return a dying device. And then here, this is going to call the function that we just made purge. One ninety seven. That's purge. One seventy nine. Aha. Uh -huh. Device expected any. So that's the probe function. Oh, that's due to this call. I see. Yes, this will have a device, and device is use create, create PCI device and then PCI device, private trait, yeah, we'll fix that, pub trait, nice, device is not implemented for E1000, impl device for E1000. Here we'll do a uh, unsafe fn purge mute self print purging e1000 device. Um, uh, we don't necessarily want it to get dropped. So purge will be separate from drop. We won't implement drop in this case. 179. Uh, 179. Devices? Oh, devices. This one needs to change. Device. Fuck yeah. Don't need any trait. Okay. So, something that implements any, that's going to return a device. Nice. So, find, found E1000, and we should be able to reboot this now. Um, reset. 
Okay, found E1000. Z, found E1000. We made it. And at the end... Uh... Oh, I wasn't able to print during the purge process. But... Um... Let's just see. I'm pretty sure... I don't know if that's going to int 3 without the clobbers. Okay, so yeah, that code's definitely getting executed. Uh, sweet. I just can't print here in the purge process, but that's fine. No problem. Um, okay, so we'll have a... We're going to have the bar, which is going to tell us where the memory is, the physical memory for the device. And we're going to see if we can access that cached as well. So we've got the PCI configuration. PCI 231, mandatory registers. Cache line size. OK, so what we need to do is we need to get the memory base address. Uh, and to do that, we'll get the memory base address register bits from here. So let bar is equal to, um, this should be device bar zero. And then assert bar and three is equal to zero, right? That's the type. Oh, bar and one is zero. Uh, E1000 device was, uh, E1000 bar zero was not a memory bar. So, uh, and here we can just do that on device. Uh, the bar zero should be a memory bar. So we'll just assert that and it definitely will be the case. And then we have a type Um, let device dot, and let's see if this works with E1000 and E1000E, but it should. Found E1000, and then let's, you know what? We can just put two nicks on here. Uh, no, uh, I'm going to add another network card. We'll add an E1000E. Okay, so we'll have an E1000 and an E1000E, both on the OS dev network. Yes. So this will test two NICs on a system, and they're slightly different. And we'll see if we handle both, which I think we do. Ooh. Okay, one of them doesn't show up as a 10OE. Okay, so we'll put this debug on. True. Reset. 10D3. Ten D3. Oh, an 82574L. Isn't that in the same family as what Y'all mentioned, I, I know I, I physically, I actually own a couple physical 82574Ls, so we'll be able to test that one on hardware. It's actually really fucking cool. Fuck yeah, dude. Um, where's that link earlier that was mentioning the different products? Here we go. So this, so this says, okay, yeah, for an 82574, well, it doesn't mention 82573, 67, 82574, oh, yeah, 574, yeah. So this is the E1000E. And these are based on the I-217. Um, I'm pretty sure I have used this uh, 
used this spec before. Sheets. I think this is it. 82574. I own this physically, so we can test this on hardware. So this is the E1000E. So hopefully we can get all three of these drivers in one go, so we can have a we can support a pretty broad range of things. Um, and let's see how this looks. So every time we implement something, we're going to see how it lines up on all these different devices. So this is the programming interface, PCI configuration space. Completely compatible with uh, deployed. Yep. And this will have uh, where are the bars at? Here are the bars. Memory bar, flash bar, IO bar. OK. They're defined as non-prefetchable and therefore support 32-bit addressing only. Huh. So, yeah, this is the memory type for the address space. And they're 32-bit only, but we can figure that out from here. So we can say, um, let uh, 64 uh, bar 64 is equal to device.bar0 and um, bits 2 and 1. So we'll do shift by one and three is equal to, if it's equal to OX10, uh, we'll do this bar type uh, gets the type of memory bar assert. the bar type is zero or the bar type is two invalid uh, valid e1000 bar zero type so we should be able to pass that no problem okay so then that'll tell if it's 64 bit or 32 bit and then this is the prefetch Prefetchable and non prefetchable. I don't think I care about those. So get the type of the memory bar. If the bar type, and then here we'll get the bar. Um, here we'll do const pub const bar mm, pub enum bar type uh, 32 bit bits 32 is equal to 0 bits 64 is equal to 2 this is a repr u32 uh, different types for PCI bars um, 32 bit bar 64 bit bar Drive clone copy. And then we'll do impl from from U32 for bar type. Fn from value 32. Give a self. Match the value with a zero bar type bits 32. 64, all other, panic, valid bar type. Okay, and then here we can do bar type is equal to bar type from this. Bar type, done. If let bar is equal to match bar type uh, get the bar and then as prefetch and then the rest is the address 
Okay. I know I'll have set my foot on Canadian soil before I die, unless COVID-19 gets me first. Bar type bits 32. Um, in this case, we grab the device up bar zero, get the memory bar for um, the E1000. In this case, we'll get bar zero. You know, I'm probably gonna say until one gigabit network card driver. Intel Gbit. I'll say Intel Gbit. Intel Gbit Nick. Because we're gonna kind of mux everything in one spot here. Because they're all so similar. Uh, bar as E64. So, bar zero and OX. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, zero. Zero, one, two, three. Those are the bottom bits. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, get the physical address of the memory for this nick fizz adder as u64. Okay. Um, 32-bit bar is just in place. Uh, mask off the bar type bits. And then this is for a 64-bit bar. A 64-bit bar, it's just the top bit. So we'll get the uh, let low bits is equal to this. Let, and then here we can return a fizz adder device.bar1 shift as u64. Shift by 32 and or that with low bits. This will uh, compute the 30, uh, 64 bit bar by grabbing both bar 0 and bar 1. So I'll get the low part from bar 0 and then the high part from bar 1 and then we have the physical address. Uh, print memory MMIO space at this uh, and this is at the bar uh, use page table fizz adder all right so this should work cool and what we can do is uh, const handled devices is equal to a 8086. Yeah, this is a list of. Yeah, one of those bad boys. And here we'll do an OX8086, OX10E. This is the E1000, which is technically. The 100E. Is technically one of these bad boys. Okay, and we're also going to support an E1000E, which is at 10D3. Um, and that's what I have in physical hardware. What am I going to grab? This is a... Uh, 10 D3. Okay. 
delete. Um, for vid did in handled devices, handled, let's mute handled is false. If device header vendor ID is equal to vid and device header device ID is equal to did handled is true break. Okay. Uh, check if we can handle this device. If not handled, return none. Uh, device is not handled. Then at this stage, whoop, yoink. Okay. Const handled devices. Provide a type, colon. Gamosa, have you ever thought about having your Twitch viewers or YouTube subscribers make a program or project uh, for you through polls in GitHub? Something along those lines. I feel like it would be a great learning experience for many. Uh, to have people like submit things that uh, I would like review or something, or that we would like work together on. Make a program or project. Okay, so this should work. Yeah, found two devices. Fuck yeah, let's see if it works on, I guess this runs um the 1533. Wow, both these machines have 1533s. Oh, fuck yeah. We're gonna get support on all of my hardware with just these NICs. The 1533 is this. Fuck yeah. Oops. Gotta manage my Tibia characters quick. But yeah, I was thinking about maybe doing a, um, like Twitch, Twitch does programming, where like people just submit random shit, and then I try and like merge it all together and make it work. <laughs> it's like random PRs or something like that, and we all write something really quickly. But I don't know how well that format would actually work, to be honest. It might just be really difficult <laughs> to do that, to be honest. To be on Why did I say to be honest so often? Yeah, basically see how people would solve a problem and go through different suggested solutions and talk about how they would work and why they're good or bad. Ooh, yeah, I could probably do that. Now, the problem is I'm not the most versed in a lot of different uh, programming like styles and concepts. I typically only do low-level le low development, so I can't really speak to people doing higher-level stuff. But... I probably could get some pretty good feedback on a lot of different uh, aspects, or even if it's just like code quality in general, or like security stuff. And this is the, um, I don't know what this is. Uh, we'll actually do this. That's the E1000. E1000E, E1000. And this is 1533. Okay. So, this is in the VM. This is on physical hardware. This is on other physical hardware. Fuck yeah. So, let's find all the bars for all those things. So, we're going to see if we can write three, three drivers in one shot. Um, is the intent to create a featureful kernel? No, not at all. It's it's going to be very specific to only the things that I'm interested in, in doing. So it's going to support mainly my physical hardware that I run on, 
Um, it's going to be pretty limited other than that. Uh, it's mainly just for research, so I don't want it to support many generic things. Ideally, I want most machines to support a network card, and that's why I've implemented this. Uh, we're going to write an E1000, E1000E. Uh, basically, the rules of this OS are if you want to run it on physical hardware, either have an Intel NIC, which you likely do, like 50% of the time you do, and if you don't, go buy an Intel NIC for 20 bucks. Because <laughs> it's more expensive for me to implement a new driver than for you to go buy a NIC. <laughs> That's basically what it comes down to. So, for people who want to use this actual, uh, this kernel for actual research, um, they'll have to do that. So, we're going to support the E1000, and that will get us support in KVM, which will get us support on basically any cloud platform in the world. Um, so, given that you're already doing your compute on the cloud, we will support that, and if you're doing compute locally, then go buy an Intel NIC, or already have one. <laughs> It's kind of going to be the rules. The different uh, vendor device IDs we support. So there we go. We get all those bars. So now what I want to do is I want to figure out how to reset them. So let's take a look here. We're going to want to reset these cards. And we'll probably just do a new... E1000 new, and this is going to be in like Intel Gbit. Intel Gbit. Intel Gbit. And then we'll just give this the bar, I think. Uh, we'll give it the bar and the vid did. Actually, we'll just give it the whole PCI device. And this will take a. Uh, impl intel gbit fn new return a self intel gbit this will have the like bar this will take the device which is a uh, PCI device uh, PCI device and this is the PCI configuration space uh, saved during the probe process. This is an Intel uh, uh, gigabit network driver. So we'll say PCI device is device. Then we'll parse out the bar ourselves. We'll move this code. If we didn't handle it, if we did handle it, um, create the new device. And I can probably reformat some of this code just a, a, a squidge. Go this here. Create the new device. If it's handled, return this. Otherwise, device is not handled, return none. Okay, check if we can handle this device. Go through all the handled devices, see if it matches. Um, uh, check if the vid did match what we support. If they do, create the new device and return it out. Holy shit, that just built, okay. Uh, this is going to have the MMIO base. It's going to be the bar. Um, MMIO base. Uh, I actually don't know what I want this to be. Um... A few years back, I did buy an E1000 to solve some Hyper-V network problems, so this this must be a valid strategy. Hell yeah, it is. Yeah, links are allowed in this chat, so no problem, as long as they're not skeevy. If it's just like YouTube or images...
Um, so, all right, let's take a look at the MMIO space for these, and we're going to see, these are going to be the, um, the registers, and I think the registers are probably all 32-bit. Bit by, blah, blah, blah. That's IO data, don't give a shit. Offsets. Yeah, I think all of these are 32-bit. Um, partial writes less than 32-bit is ignored. Partial reads return all 32. Okay. All registers are defined to be 32 bits, should be accessed as 32 bit double words, and are aligned on a 64 bit boundary. There are exceptions to this rule PCI config registers, IO space registers, register pairs where they make a larger size, uh, access the flash memory. Okay, so those are all 32 bit. So then we're going to take a look in the other specs. And I think all of these are 32 bit as well. This is for the. 710, uh, we can put this on, register summary, conventions. All registers are 32 bits and should be accessed as that. And this one, um, uh, driver, configuration space, register summary, and let's see, these are probably all the same. MMIO at bar zero. Register byte ordering. Um, LSB first, so it's all little Indian. They're all 32 bits. Okay, so all of these are all 32 bits. So we're gonna map in the registers. And let's see what they extend to. In this case, this is a byte offset. I swear I saw some in the five range. Yeah, there's some in the five range. Nine, the B6. Ooh, packet buffer memory. I'm guessing that's the end. <laughs> 19 FFF. So let me write that down quick. OX19FFF. So that's, this is for the E1000E. This is for the I210. What does this go to? I need to figure out how much memory I need to map for this space. You know, in fact, do they have a size? Do they have like a max register? I don't think so. Yeah, I think you're just supposed to know that. Okay, let's see this one. Um. So these are all the registers, wait, register summary, here we go. These offsets, I see some up in the B range. I think I saw some in the 10,000 range. Here we go. Q per multicast stats. I really wish it just told me the maximum number. So these are all the registers. What's the max register? Internal registers, flash. Huh. 
128 kilobytes. Okay. Uh, what's 128 kilobytes? Uh, stream term, Python, 128 times 1024, hex that. Yes! So it's 128K for that, and then this one, this also, 128K for that one. And what about this one? Um, is this one also 128K? It is! They're all 128K! Woo! So we'll just map in 128K space. So this is a um, memory mapped I.O. for this device. And it is going to be a box of U32s for 128K. So 128 times 1024 divided by 4, 32768. Um, these devices map 128 kilobytes of memory. Done. Fucking easy. Oh, I gotta manage my Tibia characters, which means I can read chat. Okay. Um, can you explain what the memory map means? So basically, devices on the system, so in, in the world of physical memory, you have your, your physical processors connected to memory over whatever bus it happens to be using. Now, it's possible that a device can actually watch that bus for memory transactions to see um, what memory is being accessed. So devices can actually sit on those buses. So for example, your network card, uh, in this case, that's what we're implementing, your network card might hijack uh, and observe memory accesses that go to certain ranges of the physical address space, which is exactly what we're seeing. So what this is basically telling us is the PCI configuration told us where in memory this device sits. And if we read and write memory, it doesn't actually go um, uh, how did I do that? I killed my monk, apparently. Um, um, but yeah, basically, you're able, we're able to read and write memory, and we'll say 32 times 1024, um, Basically, you can read and write memory in your application, and that will go to the card itself, the actual program itself. Um, let's see, what's going on here? But yeah, that's effectively how that works. It's a lot more complex than that, but that's effectively how it works. Uh, did I fix the APIC masking thing? Yeah, I just masked the APIC, and uh, KVM was okay with that. So we kind of we kind of made a workaround, unfortunately. Uh, oh, neat network drivers. This is something I've uh, actually done before. Highly recommend. Uh, you get inspiration. Uh, uh, the driver locket from SNABB. On the low chance uh, you haven't seen that project already. I actually haven't seen that. I don't really like third-party influences most of the time. I, I like doing everything myself because I... Because I'm just... That's what I do. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to map in the uh, physical MMIO space into uncacheable... Um, into uncacheable virtual memory. So we're going to do that through the same stuff that we do in kernel source apic uh, map raw. It's exactly this. And we got to get access to the page table and do all this shit and virtual alloc. Okay. So, get a virtual address capable of holding a 4 kilobyte mapping. In this case, it's going to be... Uh, 128 times 1024, so 128 kilobyte mapping. Oh, and then here I'm going to assert uh, bar and OXFFF 
is zero. And we're going to say non uh, four kilobyte aligned Intel Gbit Nick. Um, not sure if this can ever happen, but make sure the physical address is uh, four kilobyte aligned. Okay, and then we're gonna have MMIO. And that'll just take MMIO, which we'll get from here. Let MMIO is equal to this. Get access to physical memory. And then we're going to while uh, for physical address in bar dot zero dot dot bar dot zero dot checked add 128 times 1024 unwrap go through each of the physical addresses there and then we're going to use physical address or non-executable it's writable cache is disabled and it's present and we're going to say fail to map in um intel gbit mmio to virtual memory okay we'll say that so this is a uh, map in the 128 kilobyte of mmio space into virtual memory based on the uh, virtual address we allocated above so this should give us we gotta pull in all of these page present page right page edX page cache sable I think that's everything use page table colon colon Uh, page type. Okay. Ooh. Use crates mm alloc vert address. Oops. Vert adder 4K. All right. Do you plan to write everything yourself, including network stack? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm probably not going to accept any third-party code to this. Well, there's definitely not going to be any third-party code, and it's relatively unlikely that I'll accept any PRs. So that kind of depends on where things go, but um, this, is, this project is for me. Other people can use it and fork it, um, but this is mainly just for me. Box from raw. And we'll grab, we'll make a box from virtual address as mutes you uh, the virtual address, and we're gonna convert that into a mutable pointer to a U32 for 32 kilobytes, which is 128k. Uh, unsafe. This will be uh, box up the slice or box up. Box up the MMIO space. You know, actually, I don't want to box that because that'll cause it to get freed. Uh, static mute. We can just A this. This mapping lives for as long as this does, and it's a mutable reference to a U32 for 32K. That's better. And then this will be a unsafe core slice from raw parts. That's oh, not a slice. Mute deref this. Okay, help indicate the anonymous lifetime. 106, imp a, 4 gigabit A. Uh, 106.
Um, oh yeah, that is a static lifetime because we put it in a box. All right? Fuck. Can I... Can I do this? I don't think so. Maybe I can. Device lives for that long. Yeah. Fun is probably info on that. Um, fair enough, it's a project to, uh, what is this? It's a project to implement high-performance software switches using LuaJIT. Really nice code to read, especially for someone getting into user space networking or network drivers. It's also a great example of how impressive LuaJIT is. I think at this point, Mike Paul ha um, must have traveled from the future. Yeah, LuaJIT is insane. I have an exploit right for a uh, third-party Windows kernel driver that gives me full control over MMAP IO space parameters. I can elevate privs, uh, but I often get a reference count in BSOD. Not quite sure what is going on, but the exploit works sometimes. Uh, glad you're getting into mapping physical memory because it's confusing to me. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the... Ma mapping things in Windows can be really, really painful. Um, the memory manager in Windows is is kind of complex to deal with. It's pretty solid. Perfwise is mediocre, but it's it's really solid. But it's kind of weird to like figure out all the mapping. The the biggest issue with Windows is it has uh, paging in the kernel, which is really fucking strange. It has its own lo own Lua implementations of all the network cards. Oh, that's really cool. Um, would you know how to make a Raspberry Pi into a capture card like El, uh, Elgato? Is it even possible? No, that's not going to be possible. It, it doesn't physically have the circuitry. Um, it doesn't physically have the circuitry that allows it to capture uh, HDMI traffic. So the HDMI is an output on there. It's not an input. Um, let's see. Here's the full Intel 10 gig driver. Let's take a look at that in Lua. I just don't like Lua at all, to be honest. That's pretty fucking cool though. Looks good. Looks pretty accurate. Yeah, that looks about like what we're, we're about to do. Um, Pretty much all the Intel NICs are pretty much the same. So, how do I do this? So the problem is... What's my lifetime issue here? A plus any. So it lives for A and it implements any. I think I can do this. Lifetime parameter and sync with the lifetime A must outlive the static lifetime. So, yeah, somewhere this is getting turned into a static lifetime. Um. Hmm, how do I want to do this? I think it's because I'm boxing it up. A 
this issue with that. It's not satisfied. And the vice must be, I think any requires static. Let's take a look. However, any type which contains a non-static reference does not. Yeah. So we'll make this a static reference. Okay, done. 86, call the unsafe function. It's unsafe. Yes, sir. Filled in a map in that. And that's, so this is not correct. Because we're remapping that vatter over and over again. So this should actually panic. Filled the map, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to see. We have to add the offset we are into the mapping uh, so let offset is equal to bar dot zero or patter minus bar dot zero. Uh, compute the offsets into MMIO space. Then we'll vert adder v adder dot zero plus offset. Uh, we got to pull that in from page table. Uh, we'll put it here. Okay. So that'll create that MMIO space. So now let's see if that is behaving correctly. So we're going to read something out of it. Hopefully there's something good that we can read. Device control device status. Device status. Let's get status, maybe. You know, we'll just reset it. Uh, that's bit 26 to reset. Is it bit 26 on all of them, though? Now, this is where we're making the guesses. 26 is reset on this one. Control. 26, reset, and it's self-clearing. All right, so what we can do is we can go to MMIO. This is the zeroth. We're going to, uh, we'll unsafe this. Yeah, we'll do this. Um, FN, write, reg, register. And how do they do this in the manual? Uh, reg offset. So use size val. This will uh, write unsafe. Um. Write val to the MMIO Intel register at reg offset. Ah! Maybe I should make an enum here. Uh, we'll do this for now, and then we'll figure it out. Um, this is the offset into MMIO space in bytes, not the register. ID and then we'll do reg offset is reg is equal to reg offset divide size of u32 use core mem size of okay so then we'll do a core pointer right volatile to the register of a value. And in this case, uh, we'll write to self.mmio reg. This takes a mutable reference to self. So we're going to write uh, 
Oh, and this will be mute. So you get the pointer to that register, and then we write a value, and then this is a read a value, read from, this is the offset, uh, we can do this. Yeah. Text with 79, okay, there we go. Read volatile of that. This now returns a U32. All right. One second, I gotta manage my tibia characters here. There we go. All right. Okay, missing semicolon. Well, I gotta rename this, uh, read reg. Read reg. In the case of Rust, I'm actually not missing a semicolon here. Uh, that'll return the value from the function. So everything in Rust is a statement, or, well, everything in Rust is an expression. So the result of the expression is the final thing that doesn't have a semicolon. Um, so that's basically the return value, is the value that was read out of that register. Now in this case, we can technically say it doesn't need to be mute to have access to read reg. Okay, so now we're gonna print, or actually we'll do, um, we will do a self.write reg. Oop, let mute Nick. Can I do self? Can I do this? Does Russ let me do that? Can I name a variable self? No. Uh, Nick. Uh, create the Nick. And then at this point, we should be able to do Nick.write reg. Yeah, we'll just do write. Nick.write at zero. We're going to write the value of Nick.read at zero. Ord with the reset bit. Uh, and what bit was that? 26. So this will reset the nick. So in theory, that's unsafe. So in theory, I think if I should not be able to um, soft reboot, because this will reset the nick and then it won't be in the right state for the soft reboot and I think it won't work. Well, I bet iPixie re reinitializes it. It does look like iPixie reinitializes it. I don't think real hardware does though. Oh, failed to map it in. Wait, what? Um. For the physical address, ooh, in step by. Dot step by 4096. See, that's why we like putting really heavy asserts in all of our code. Okay, bam. All course online? That init both of those nicks. Let's see if we can soft reboot. And we can. Okay, I'm kind of surprised by that. Let's try it on hardware. Hmm. 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 Got the physical address. Print mapping X to X. Uh, vatter dot zero plus offset pattern. Oh, did I put 16? Oh, thank you so much, man. That's totally what it is. I was about to spend a long fucking time debugging that one. Reset. 
Okay, that one I I still can soft reboot that. Let's try it here. Hey! The soft reboot broke. And that means we broke the nick, which means we definitely reset it. Hell yeah! <laughs> We're writing a nick driver. All right, I'm going to hit the head, refill my wine. You you guys should refill your wine too. I'll be right back. All right. I have some green beans here. So if you hear me crunching, it's because I got some green beans to snack on right now. I love green beans. Are they canned? Fuck no. I, had, I do not like canned green beans. Okay. Wow. So we reset the nick. All right, so let's read the manual for the 574. Normally zero, one B initiates the reset, it's self-clearing. Um. So let's see. Oh yeah, I don't think there's actually a, anything that tells you what to do. I think we just have to look at the descriptions. So we're gonna reset it. Um, set link up, that looks pretty important. Full duplex, half duplex. Full duplex. Initial value zero. Uh, set link up. It must be set to permit to permit the Mac to recognize the link signal from the Phi, uh, which indicates the Phi has gotten the link up. Okay. I think it's inline functions is what tells me how to do this. Is it? No, initialization. Here we go. Here we go. Soft reset. Can write the reset. It rereads it. Uh, note that the reset is per function and resets only the function that received the software reset. Configurations... Uh, is unaffected. Okay. So 
so let's see. These, these manuals are so good. These uh, Nick manuals by Intel are so fucking good. Like, it's just literally going to tell me exactly what I have to do, and I love it. Um, okay. Uh, reset operation. Okay, software and sequence. Disable interrupts. Um, okay. Initial a global reset and perform general configuration. Th this is the seven step process to get a NIC working on, a, on, a, on these. Disable interrupts. Issue a global reset and perform configuration. Set up the file in the link. Initialize the stat registers. Initialize the receive, initialize the transmit, and enable interrupts. That's it. So fucking easy. Um, disable interrupts during initialization to prevent re-entrancy. Interrupts are disabled by writing to the IMC register. Um, note that they need, ooh, note that the interrupts need to be disabled also after issuing a global reset. So the typical is to do this, disable interrupts, issue a global reset, disable interrupts. After it completes, a typical driver enables the desired interrupts by writing to the IMS register. So we got to figure out how to disable interrupts. So we'll disable the interrupts. I mean, it doesn't really matter because I have all my drivers, or I have, well, hmm. Anyways, typically starts with a global reset that puts it in a known state and it enables the software control. Um, Several things need to be set up at power up. Full duplex should be set uh, if done in software. Or if it's set with auto negotiation. Speed is determined via that. Or forced by software if the link is forced. Um, okay. Holy shit, that's a big bird. What the fuck is that? What is that bird? Holy shit. That bird is massive. That a... It's, it's hiding behind the my grill, but it, it's... It's huge. I would say it has at least like a five or six foot wingspan. Holy fuck. It's got like a massive beak. It just flew away. Dude, I have no idea what that is. It has like a massive beak. I would actually say it's, it looked more like a bill than a beak. Let me see. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and search for large birds. It looked like an aquatic bird. Oh, it might have been like a crane. Let me see. Hmm. Dude, I don't know what that was. I, I feel like it looked like a fucking dinosaur. <laughs> See you around, Napalm. Get some good sleeps. Is it a buzzard? No, not a buzzard. 
Like, it had really long legs. It, it, it had, like, really long, skinny legs. Like, I would say the, the legs alone were, like, six inches. So it wasn't, like, a normal-looking bird. It looked, it looked like something that belongs by the ocean. Totally a crane. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, it definitely is. It was a crane. I don't know which one. It's like fucking crazy, man. What a, what a crazy animal. It looks like a, a fucking dinosaur. <laughs> huh. A lot of them are really endangered. I wonder if that's a rare a rare bird. <laughs> rare birds. I've seen that one twice. It's been the same one. It comes by like once once a month it seems. We all know that dinosaurs aren't real. Yeah, that's true. But then who did Adam and Eve hang out with? Stats are hardware initialized to values as detailed in particular. Beacons at transition to that. Guaranteed be done within one millisecond. Um, all of them are cleared on read, and a typical software driver reads them, thus making them rear zero. I don't care about the stats, so I don't give a shit. I think we just program the receive stuff. Multicast generally means zeroing all the entries initially and adding in entries as requested. Uh, I don't care. Program the interrupt mask register to pass any interrupt that the driver cares about. Those are the bits. Don't care. Program R control. If initializing at this stage, it is best to leave the receive logic disabled. An RCTL. Okay. So we're going to have an RCTL structure. RCTL here. Receiver enable. So I think we just set that. So see packets require simply that the receiver is enabled. TX, set that up. And then at the end, what do you do? Do you just enable RX and TX as separate? Yeah, I think we're just good, man. I think we uh, I think we reset it. The manual didn't say that we should pull. Um, yeah, manual didn't say that we should pull to see if... Uh, if the reset completed. So let's take a look. Um... Introduction, packet reception. Um, I'm pretty sure I just put that shit in the receive buffer. Ooh. Okay, so here are the receive descriptors. These might be different per status, checksum, length, status and errors. Oh, yeah, I remember this shit. Dude, this is all coming back to me. So we're going to reset the nick, and then we're going to do, like, while... Nick dot read zero and one shift twenty six is not equal to zero. It doesn't say this in the manual, but I'm just gonna do this anyways. Uh, and I'm gonna print uh, reset not clear yet. I'm just gonna see if we see that. Okay. Well, yeah, 
in physical hardware, in physical hardware, it seems like that sometimes doesn't take effect. So we'll do this. Um, and this, uh, wait for the reset to clear. And we'll turn these things into constants once we figure this out, but read that and it with 26. If it's non-zero, we're just going to pull until that reset bit is cleared. And then what we're going to do, we're going to set up a receive buffer. Um, packet reception. And we're currently going to, we're just going to exclusively look at the E1000. Just, just to keep it simple, we're just going to like proof of concept one of these quickly. Make sure it works, and then we'll get it working on all of them. Easy fucking peasy. Mary Pointer's pointed to at the descriptor store packet data. They support seven receive buffer sizes. I guess we'll be using 16K. Send the RCTL those. So we have the receive descriptor format. Let's see if that has changed. Um, RDBAL, this is the receive descriptor base address, which is a linked list, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The low bits are always ignored. And that's a physical address, I'm pretty sure. So you go to physical address. All right, let's see uh, here. Packet receptions. Legacy received descriptor format. Yep. That has not changed. And we'll use legacy. I'm guessing new ones give you new features, but we'll do legacy. Right? We're just going to try and get the shit working. So... Maxis is 9018, that's the largest jumbo frame. That's just 9k plus an IP header. Um, these receipt buffer sizes are supported. So is, we'll do 16k. Buffer size is selected by the bit settings in the receive control register. B size, B sex, B type, and flix buff. In legacy mode, places no alignment restrictions on receive memory buffer addresses. This is desirable in situations where it was allocated in higher layers. Okay, yep. So here's the legacy format. If that is clear, it uses the legacy format. So, and that's what we'll do. So the receive control. So we have to make a couple of these descriptors. And these will point to physical memory that we'll get DMA'd into. So. And they need to be, they need to be phys physically contiguous, I think. Or, upon receipt, of a packet for this device, hardware stores the packet data into the indicated buffer and writes all this shit. Okay. Um, it's enabled when this is set to 1B. Stops receptions. They're immediately dropped until it's set back to 1. Store bad packets. Um, ooh. So I think we'll do that. We'll do store bad packets, unicast promiscuous, multicast promiscuous. Um, I 
loopback mode, multicast offset, broadcast accept mode, receive buffer size, pad small packets, strip share C. Okay, so I think all we care about store bad, unicast promiscuous, multicast promiscuous. And broadcast accept and receive buffer size. So we're going to see if those line up between the two manuals. And I suspect they will. Um, so I'm just going to look for this. No, it can't find it. Okay. This is in the... Receive registers, R control. All right, enable, store bad packets, it's the same, UP, MP, LP, LBM. B size is at 16, yeah, it's, yep. Uh, what's B6? Buffer size extension. Set to 1B. The original ones are multiplied by 16. Mmm. So I think we'll do 2K. We'll do 2K, uh, buffer size. Alright, let's try it. We're going to do a uh, repr c struct r receive descriptor. We'll call it legacy. Buffer len checksum status errors. Special. All right. Drive debug. So I'm pretty sure we have to make a list of these. I don't think we have to initialize any of them. I think we just zero them out. I'm pretty sure. Vec drive default. Um. Let rx buffs is equal to vec. Oh, do these have to be contiguous in physical memory? That's fine. As long as it's under a page, we're fine here. So we'll do vec legacy receive descriptor default. Uh, we'll put eight of them in there for now. So these are the rx buffers. I'll zero it out. Uh, descriptor, and then we'll put in there uh, rx buffs. Uh, let mute buffs is equal to vec new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vec new for this in zero dot dot thirty two buffs. Dot push. Uh, let buffer is equal to a vec OU8 2048. Then we're going to do buffs. Let pointer is equal to buffer as pointer as U64. Buffs dot push buffer. Rx buffs dot push legacy receive. Legacy, receive, descriptor. And then we'll do dot dot default. Default. So fill in everything with the default fields except for the buffer, which will be the pointer. Uh, default. So we're going to hopefully get this set up here, and then we'll pull in vector. Vector. 
All right. So this is create the Rx descriptors and the buffers. So we'll reset the nick. We'll wait for the reset to clear. We got to get the physical address of these buffers. Receive status. So I think there's just head and tail, right? Um, I'm pretty sure I just program head equals tail, maybe. Initialization, inline functions, packet reception. Okay. Filtering, don't give a shit. Receive data storage, we're gonna use uh, 2K. It's multiplied by that. Legacy format. Okay, we make those fields. Status field, this tells us stuff about that. Extended Rx descriptor. So that's apparently if we do extended, but we're not doing that. Oh, DD. Um, must clear it before it handles the received descriptor. Software device can use this bit later as a completion indication of the hardware. Okay, so we'll clear that. But I, yeah, I think that's like descriptor done or something. Extended status, don't care, don't care, don't care, don't care. Don't care. Packet split received descriptor, don't care. Receive descriptor fetching, packing. Okay, so here's the structure, right? Here's what we're making. We're making this list of all of the descriptors. So we made, we made 32 descriptors in a list and we're gonna have a head and a tail and a base and a base plus size. So basically, it maintains two secular queues and writes back uh, the use descriptors just prior to advancing the head pointer. So I think what we have to do here, we set the base address to the descriptor table. We set the length, which is the maximum number of bytes allocated to the circular buffer. It must be a multiple of 128 the maximum cache line size. Since each descriptor is 16 bytes in length, total number of received descriptors is always a multiple of eight. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Well, 32 is a multiple of eight. So then we have the head register holds a value which is an offset from the base and indicates uh, in progress descriptor. There can be up to 64 kilobytes in the circular buffer. Harder maintains a shadow copy that includes those descriptors completed, yeah, not yet short in, stored in memory. This holds an offset from the base and identifies the location beyond the last descriptor that hardware can process. This is the location where software writes the first new descriptor. Okay. So tail is basically the end of the list and the head is the... The head is where hardware writes to, and the tail is where software writes to. If it allocates buffers and uses memory to check for completed, it simply has to zero the status byte in the descriptor to make it ready for reuse. Not a hardware requirement. Um, moving the hardware tail pointer is. The head pointer points to the next descriptor that will be written back. At the completion, so if they're equal, I think if they're equal, okay, yeah, hardware dis, hardware owns all descriptors between the head and the tail. Um, yeah, so tail points to invalid. So basically head points to this offset. So we have this whole receive queue, base and base plus size. Okay, this should be pretty fucking easy, I think. 
So we have to write that, uh, we have to write to the length, the Rx length thing. So we'll go find that. Airfield, don't give a shit. Descriptor fetching. This is basically how it works. Okay, here's the queue structure. Oh, it, it's literally the same shit. Artie Bell and Artie Ba. 64-bit address is aligned on that boundary. Contains the lower. That contains the upper. Hardware owns all the descriptors between head and tail. Artie Len. 16, always multiple of 8. It's the same fucking documentation from new to old. So all we have to figure out is... It's an offset from the base and identifies the location beyond the last descriptor hardware can process. Note that the tail should point to an area in the descriptor ring, somewhere between the RBDA and the RD... This is because the tail points to the location where software writes the first new descriptor. Tail should still point to an area in the descriptor ring, between there and the length. Does that mean I need one that's empty on the end? I don't think so. Um... Okay, I, th I think I think this is just easy. I think we just go to the dis the summary, wherever the summary of all the registers was. Here we go. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna write to the receive control. That's to enable it. This is the RD base low. So we're gonna get the physical address of. Uh, we're going to get the physical address. Oh, yeah, we need to get the physical for this as well. So we'll do... Yeah, we got to get access to the, this shit. We'll just do that permanently for here. Get access to physical memory. We'll end up returning out. Okay. So what we'll do is we will grab the physical address of the pointer. So we'll do page table dot translate pointer and mute pmem and pointer dot page vert adder. And then page returns the size of the page, as well as the virtual address. So I think this is the virtual address. I'm just doing this to see what the type is. So this will uh, potentially cause a print error, and then we'll be able to see what type we actually have here uh, on this field. And I think it's a vert adder. No page on option mapping. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we'll unwrap that. And then page dot zero. So we convert the pointer to a physical address. Unwrap that. And then we get page dot unwrap dot zero. So this is the physical address. So we got the physical address of that memory, and I'll put that here. Buffer is at fizz. So we fill in the physical address and yep, found a fizz adder. So that's gonna have you know what? We can we can do that. Physical address of a, of a buffer. So we allocate a buffer. We then look up the physical address of that buffer. Um, now nah, we'll, we will have to do this, U64. So we're using default. We'll, we'll clean this code up in a minute. I just want to get this to work, and then once it's working and we have confidence that we know what we're doing, then it should get easier. So now we got to get the physical address, get the physical address of the Rx descriptors. So this is the RX desks, and that's basically the ring buffer here. So RX desks 
fizz is equal to this. So we'll do a translate of virtual address rx desks as pointer as u64 unwrap page unwrap zero. So that's the physical address of the rx descriptor. So that now means I can program the uh, receive descriptor base low. So we're going to write in the, we're going to tell the uh, network card where it can find the ring buffer of these descriptors. So we created this list of descriptors and we're going to tell the network card where it can find it. And we'll do this by writing to nick.write. 2800 for this specific one. These are like magic numbers that we're probably gonna have to change per device, but that's fine. We can have a lookup table for these. So we're gonna write the low part of the address, which is the uh, descriptor physical as U32. And then to the high part, which is at four, we'll take the physical shift it by 32 and convert it to U32. Um, so this is the low, high, and this code is pretty bad right now, so we're, we're cleaning it up. Or we will clean it up. 2808, this is gonna have the length. Rx descriptors, um, core, mem size of val, and then we'll pass this rs rx descriptors as slice uh, right in the size of the uh, descriptor q because that's the size in bytes I'm pretty sure as u32 so we write in the length of that q now we're going to set the head and the tail. I think we set 2810. We're going to set the head to zero. And we'll set the tail to, I think it's a byte offset. So we'll set that to the um, Q size is equal to this. All right, let's see. All right. Q size is U32. Q size as U32. Uh, set the head, set the tail, and the network card owns all the buffers between the head and the tail. Uh, what's a kernel? It's a popcorn thing. No, a kernel is um, typically referred to like the core component of your operating system. So if you're running, uh, let's say Windows or Linux or FreeBSD or Mac OS X or whatever, whatever you're running, uh, at the heart of that operating system is, is typically considered the kernel. And that's what's responsible for managing your devices. That's your graphics card, that's your RAM, that's your processor, all the components inside your computer. The kernel typically manages all those devices and all of that memory and provides that in some meaningful way through some abstractions such that software doesn't have to understand exactly what the system is. And that's why you can have a browser that works on uh, your Windows machine, on your modern computer, and on your old computer because the, the kernel is responsible for providing a unified environment where it abstracts away all of the weird things related to hardware and makes it show up as kind of one uniform, similarly behaving machine in all contexts. I think that's the best description of a kernel, but it's kind of the core, lowest level part of the software that runs on your computer. Okay, so this sets the low and high, the base, we set the descriptor queue, we set the head, we set the tail, and now I think I should be able to actually enable this. Nick.write, OX, uh, so we wanna write to the receive control, which is at OX100, right? I'm looking at these numbers. All the numbers that I'm getting here are coming from these. So when I look for the, the low part, it's um, 
2800, 2804 for the high part. 2808 is where the length of the descriptor Q is. 2810 is where the head is. 2818 is where I put the tail. And then if we look at the other manual, this kind of shows that the head points to the start, tail points to here. This is the base. Here's the base plus size. Everything is in bytes. So we point the head to this. In this case, we're pointing the head to the start and we're pointing the tail to one after the end. I don't know if that one after the end is gonna hurt it. I don't think so. It might be required that I have one empty entry at all times, uh, but I don't know if that's actually the case. So we'll figure out that and then let's see if we can enable it. Enable Rx. And we do this by writing to receive control. And we're gonna write enable. We're gonna write store bad packets. We're gonna write a, a unicast promiscuous, multicast promiscuous. Um, loopback we don't need. Oh, this is the minimum threshold size. The corresponding interrupt is set when it gets to this smaller size. So this is what you use to uh, control the amount of interrupts you get. Um, basically, when you run out of descriptors to, to a certain level, so this is saying if you are at half utilization of your buffers, it'll fire an interrupt saying, hey, yo, you should probably make some room uh, for some more buffers. But we're going to ignore that. We don't care about that. We're gonna put on the BAM, the broadcast accept mode. We'll set the size, which is zero, shift 16, so that's the size. That's basically saying their uh, 2K is the size that we allocated for the receive buffers. VLAN filter, CFI, DPF, pass mat control frames, uh, buffer size extensions. I think this should be it, this should enable RX. So now what I can do is I can do a while self dot, uh, actually while rx descriptors zero, and we gotta do a, a core pointer read volatile. And while the rx descriptors at zeros, um, I think the status, while the status is zero, loop and then print. Here we're gonna hex print uh, Rx descriptor zero. We'll, we'll super pre print that. And basically, what this is gonna do, that's gonna enable Rx, and then we're gonna wait for the status to be non zero. I don't think this is gonna work. Uh, oh, deadlock detected. Um, And that's at 332. Oh, because we allocate some vectors. Yeah, so every time we translate uh, physical memory, so we'll do this. Let's vert to phys is equal to, a, we'll take in a virtual address. This will return a physical address. And we'll be able to do this. So we're gonna make a small closure here. Uh, that'll basically do this. This cleans up the code anyway, so this is probably good. This will take a vert, and that will return the physical address. Uh, translate the to a physical. So then here we'll do let fizz is equal to vert to fizz of the pointer. Uh, vert adder pointer and here we can say buffer as pointer and then we store that buffer into a vector so we don't have to worry about that getting dropped yet we need a semicolon here 143 vert adder okay pmm page table 153 so in this location we will translate the virtual address of the Rx descriptors. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, get rid of the semicolon, and I think we're good. We're close, 143. As U64 on that pointer. Okay, um... Holy shit! That filled in a packet of length 40! <laughs> what? <laughs> that just fucking worked! <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> no fucking way! Unfucking real! Oh my god! <laughs> oh, oh my god, man! Buffs zero dot dot for the length RX descripts uh, zero dot len as u size packet. Got packet. I can't fucking believe that. Wow. Wow. Uh, yeah, some stuff's broken because uh, we don't, I don't think we disable interrupts on that. So it starts sending interrupts to us. Anyways, there's a packet. Yeah, that looks like a real fucking packet, man. I can't believe it! Oh my god! <laughs> That's totally a packet! That memory was zeroed! We zeroed out that memory! We zeroed out that memory and then there it is! Right fucking there! <laughs> oh my god! Status 7, you wanna see what status 7 means? Uh, it means the descriptor is filled in, so the DD bit is set. Uh, but we'll take a we'll take a look at what it actually means. Oh my god, that was so fucking easy. Ugh. <laughs> it's under 200 lines of code, and we got packets coming in. Fuck yeah. The uh, code's not even clean yet. I don't even. I haven't even gotten rid of a lot of dedupes. Or duplicates. Um, okay, here's the status. So DD, DD means that the uh, descriptor is done. E, EOP means end of packet. And then IXSM means that the checksum content should be ignored. Um, when it's zero, it indicates whether the hardware performed the IP and UDP checksum. Oh, I see. I bet if I change this, well, I'm taking a big shot in the dark, so this one might not work. But if I change that one bit, um, the one that checks for like valid packets or whatever. Anyways, we're gonna we're gonna put this in a loop. We'll set the. I think we set the head. When we're, the head gets incremented as the network card fills things in, it'll set the head. So it'll fill in all these things and then eventually it'll get to the tail and it will stop. At which point I think we just set the head back to zero. So we'll just do that and then we can push the tail up and it will, the head will consume until the tail. Okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's all we have to do. So, what we're gonna do is, um, loop, and we should probably make everything in here volatile reads, because this is DMA'd stuff, so we probably want our volatile read the packets to make sure that they actual come, actually come from memory. We should actually allocate the packets in physical memory uh, in a known shape, but whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll polish this stuff up and, and get that better. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop uh, for packet in, we'll say packet ID in zero dot dot. How many packets do we do? We're doing 32 right now. We're hard coding numbers right now, which is really bad, but we're gonna, all this shit's gonna get thrown away pretty quickly. 
Um, and then in this case, packet ID. So now that we're working with hardware, I'll, um, some of this stuff will not work uh, because the software will cache this information for us. So we need to tell, first of all, the compiler is going to assume that these values don't change, right? So we have to tell the compiler, hey, make sure you actually read this value because it could have changed. Uh, and we also have to tell hardware to not cache it. Now, depending on the NIC, the network card might actually snoop cache messages and it might update the caches based on what has been changed or the DMA bus might do that. It depends on configuration. Anyways, we're going to go through all of the packets here. We're going to get the packet and then when we're done with it, we'll set rx desks pid status to zero and we'll do a uh, core pointer write volatile. Okay, and that's a 188 uh, mutable reference to that. So we'll zero out the status and we'll print all these packets. So reboot, uh, we gotta do this. We have interrupts enabled, we gotta turn that off. So we got one packet. Oh, packet's coming in. Packet's coming in. Packet's coming in, it's totally fucking working. Okay, and it will probably stop once it gets to 32. Actually, I'm gonna change these to uh, eight. Oh, so fucking easy, man. Um, rxdesks.len. Packets here. Get your packets here. So that'll eventually, I think that'll get stuck, but uh, we'll reset it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's eight. Oh, we're still getting more. Okay, yeah, because we're setting those as... I guess we don't have to set the head? We don't have to set the head at all in this situation because the... There's something in there that mentioned that. Software adds receive descriptors by advancing the tail pointer to refer to the address of the entry just beyond the last valid descriptor. Set that to the entry that's beyond it. The hardware adjusts the internal tail pointer accordingly. As packets arrive, they're stored in memory, and the head pointers is incremented by hardware. When the head pointer is equal to the tail pointer, the queue is empty. Hardware stops storing packets in system memory until the software advances the tail pointer, making more receive buffers available. Okay. So let's see if we just don't update the status, does it stop storing? And I think the answer is yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nope. Oh. I think this is just repeating what is in there. Because we don't zero out the status. And I guess... I think if we zero it out, hardware will just use it. I'm pretty sure... Hardware will just use this and it will keep going forever. Anyways, we can pull open a... Um... Eh. Eh. I'll do this. Actually, I think I have Wireshark set up where it doesn't need those perms. So what is this network on? This is called OS DevNet. I think that's Verber 2. Let me check. Um, where's the best way to check that? Vert Manager? This Vert Manager is really struggling.
I have no idea why this interface is like getting so stuck. And now that's not rendering either. Oh my god. Virtual networks, OS dev, Verber 2. Okay. So the Verber 2. So. Will we have this in like full promiscuous mode? Um. Fuck it. Uh, NCAT UDP and we give it a host name 192.168.1. I don't know what this server is. Uh, 101.11. That's the IP of this machine. 50. A enter. I don't know if this is actually sending the UDP packets. I feel like it's not. I mean, these are definitely network packets. Like, it's definitely working. I'm just curious where the... Um... Yeah... Hmm. 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 Um. How how does netcat work? Ncat work. Is it cuz I'm not getting ICMP for that? Can I broadcast? Ugh. 192.168.101.255. There it is! There's my A's! They're my A's! See them? See my A's? The four ones? Those are A's. Totally fucking works! Woo! Easy! Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So fucking simple. And then I guess hardware just picks up those descriptors. God damn, we're good. <laughs> oh my god. Here, we'll put some four twos in there instead. Bam! Easy! <laughs> Dude, I was not expecting it to just work that easily. Wow. Wow. Blank checksum. Errors special. Don't really care. All right. I guess we should probably start doing this code correctly then. Time to send. Nah, we're gonna we're gonna clean up this code first. We're gonna do an Alec Fizz. Um could I just use my existing physical memory allocator? I don't really need to virtually map these things. I probably should. So this is going to allocate fn alloc fizz t as unsafe, of course. This will take in a... a this will take an initial value and it'll return a fizz adder. A vert adder fizz adder. No, it'll return a fizz adder and a mutable, uh, static 
mute reference to a T. And here we're going to uh, assert size. Shut that the size of T is greater than zero and size of T is less than 4096. And then how did we allocate fizz up here? Oh, okay, we got a virtual address. Honestly, we'll just assert it's greater than zero. Uh, invalid. Okay, and we might put this in MM if this is a routine we're gonna use more frequently. This is gonna allocate uh, size of T capable of holding a T. So you got a virtual address that can hold a T. Then we're gonna ask the memory manager, uh, kernel source MM alloc fizz. Yeah, I think we want to use the page allocator. Yeah. This will allow us to allocate a page. Oops. Page. So we're just always going to allocate virtual memory capable of holding a... Uh, 4096 bytes. So allocate a virtual address for this mapping. So this is allocate fizz uncacheable. So we get virtual memory. We're then going to get physical memory by going to pmem. So here we'll do pmem dot. Uh, alloc fizz. That's the core of our allocator, isn't it? It is. Yeah, they'll get from the free list. So we're going to do layout from size align 4096 unwrap. So that'll get us a physical address. And they'll panic if it fails. Okay, we gotta comment all this out temporarily while we fix everything. Dude, aren't Intel network cards so fucking easy? It's not like this for like broad common stuff. So that's gonna be the physical address. Um, allocate a page for this allocation. And that'll go from the page list, so that'll be a little bit more optimized. And then at the end, we return the physical address. And we got to make a mapping of that. So we'll do that through here. Dot. This is at the virtual address. So we're going to map at virtual address. We're going to map the physical address dot zero. Um, map the memory as uh, R W dash on cacheable. And this is filled to allocate on cacheable memory. Melnox cards are insanely complex. Yeah, I've done a InfiniBand 56 gigabit uh, Melnox driver. Well, I started one and then I gave up because it wasn't worth it. Their documentation was so bad. Um. Okay. So, core slice from, oh, no, this is a um, mute DREF. 
virtual address dot zero as mute t. Um, we should initialize that first. So we'll do core pointer write to vatter dot zero as mute t write in the value. Uh, initialize the memory and then we return a mutable reference to that and then uh, return out the pmem and the virtual mapping of it. So we allocate 4K. We make sure that it fits within 4K. Uh, less than or equal to. So if the size T is less than or equal to 4K and it's greater than zero, make a virtual, get a virtual address, allocate a page, map the virtual address to that page as non-executable, writable, cache disabled, present. Initialize the memory by writing the value to it and then return out the pmem and the virtual mapping of it. Done. Um, use page table fizzmem. 139 layout comes from use core alloc layout, I think. Page table 143. Ah, yeah, we got to get access to the page table. Okay. Make a virtual address, size align that, allocate that. Now. We can do the same thing, create the Rx descriptors and buffers. In this case, we're going to do uh, let Rx descriptors fizz and Rx descriptors is equal to, can that size assert happen at compile time? Yes, it always does because the size cannot change on that value. The T, we haven't marked T as uh, uh, dynamically sized, and thus it, that is uh, compile time. Well, it's not compile time. It's um, compile time, it'll, it'll make it unconditionally, it'll, it'll omit it, basically. It'll either panic at runtime unconditionally, or it'll omit the code. So there's no overhead to it, but unfortunately, it will not compile time uh, assert that. Okay, so this will do alloc fizz uncached, and we're gonna allocate a legacy receive descriptor default, and we'll splat that out 32 times. Um, then down here, So all those are zero. This is actually going to write to zero memory until we fill them in. But these guys just need to change a little bit. Read volatile. Um, 176. Ah, yeah. R Rx descriptors. I think it's just size of that. 200 buffs and then here we will do um, let mute rx buffs is equal to vec new and then we'll do for this in i i and zero dot dot rx descriptors dot len rx descriptors dot i i dot buffer and then here we'll do rx buff fizz rx buff is equal to alloc fizz uncacheable of an ou8 for 2048 bytes because that's the size of a packet the buffer is equal to the rx buff fizz 
and then rx buff stop push rx buff and this will be rx buffs got some unsafe going on Is that actually unsafe? I don't think it is. Um, Alec Fizz, that's not unsafe. I think it's just this that's unsafe. Oh, and this. One sixty four. Copy. One fifty nine. Dear for a raw pointer. Unsafe. What do you mean that's unsafe? Okay, so this should work. Nice, it does. And then we should be able to send A's. And we get the A's. Okay, sweet. So this is looking better. And what I'm going to want to do is... So I guess the the network card just permanently the network card just permanently runs. Yeah, it's almost getting right. We can do this. Yeah, it's E to D are the physical addresses. But yeah, that's working just fine. Um, okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to clear one of these bits. Uh, so first of all, I don't know. Uh, we'll set all of this stuff up, and then the head's going to be chasing the tail. When sent along with EOP, the receive packet is complete in main memory. Oh, I guess this supports... This is a, I should be able to send a large UDP packet. You know, I actually never did this in my original... Let me, let me do this. Vim test.py. Import sockets uh, are from socket import star. Sock is equal to socket af inet ip uh, sock dgram ip proto udp. And I should be able to do a. Well, I'm going to get individual packets unless it will handle the IP stuff for me. And I don't think it does by default. I think that's something I'd have to program. So I'm going to do a sock.send2 uh, 192.168.101.255 on port 50 and bytes ASDF. I don't know if it's this way or the other way. It's the other way. And I shouldn't have to bind in this situation. Permission denied. Oh, uh, I have to add broadcast to the socket. Uh, I, I need to be able to send it. Uh, set sock opt Python. Level op name so. Uh, 
fuck. Python send broadcast EDP. So broadcast. There we go. And I don't need, okay, nice. So those packets are getting sent. Uh, test.py, while true. So I'm gonna do this, ASDF. And there we go, we see all the packets coming in. Beautiful, ASDF. And then it looks like this has the, that might have the checksum on the end of the packet. So we're looking at like the true, the true network frame that went out kind of over the, over the network. And that includes the, I think it's called the ECS, I think, which is the checksum for the whole packet that's at the end. It's not the checksum for the like IP header or the UDP header. It's the checksum for like the whole uh, frame. So, let's see what happens if I try and send. I'm gonna try and send uh, A times 8092. Okay. Seven, seven. Okay, yeah, so we just see all those packets individually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce um, receive descriptor format, write back. Oh, process of cache line size that are larger than receive super size. Um, null descriptor padding and receive descriptor packing. I don't actually know if I have to do uncacheable here. Yeah, I don't think I have to do uncacheable. Let's see what the caching is here. Um, yeah, I think PCI cache update x86 um only support uncached rate combining accesses Cashable memory, at least on some processors, have to be careful. I think, yeah, MMIO, I don't want to have cashable, but I think the uh, DMA. Dude, this dude's a fucking wizard. He's on, like, all the Intel posts. So, MMIO space, I want uncached, which I do. But I don't think the actual buffers that I use have to be uncached. Um, uh, XCD6. Um. That's that what we were just looking at. <sighs> see, Let's see if this mentions it. No. Hmm. I think it depends on the NIC. Uh, I know that. 
Yeah, cache coherency on the DMA. This is suggesting that it actually updates that when it DMAs the memory. Search for a cache. Process of a cache line. Uh, by fetching a cache line or more in each burst. It's all it mentions on cache. I, I think for the DMA, it doesn't need to be. I think the X540. Uh, the X540 spec. data sheet well let's see what we got here i think this one mentions the cache modes where you can actually disable the the caching where it doesn't snoop yeah so there's no snoop on that let's see if this mentions snoop it doesn't um X540 enables the no snoop feature by default after power on. Uh, it must be disabled during RxFlow initialization if there's no intention to use it. Disable set no snoop to none. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely updating the, the caches. I don't think we have to actually mark that uncacheable. Because if we, if we do this, um, if we have that memory as cacheable, oh, not that one. That's the MMIO space. We definitely want that one to be ca uncached. But this one, if I do eight entries, if they differ, I'm definitely not evicting the cache lines. So... Python, send all those packets. Um, yeah, and that uses full size, 346. Python, 346, how big is that? 838, is that really the size those packets are? Okay, so then what I can do is I can change the size, which is this. I'm gonna set the size to a really small size. Um, quit. I'm curious how this will behave. I think that's the size. I need to find the actual register. Main registers, filter. Receive base. Those have to be zero, that's fine. That's the high part. The length, 128 byte aligned. Receive descriptor head. And let's see, the only time that software should ever write to this register is after a reset and before enabling the receiver function. If software to write to this while it's enabled, on-chip descriptor buffers can be invalidated and other indeterminate operations might result. Reading the descriptor head to determine which buffers are finished is not reliable. Okay. So, this is the tail. Software writes to the tail register to add received descriptors to the hardware free list for the ring. So if that ring, I think it just loops around on that DD bit that we give it. So as long as we clear the DD bit, I think it just reclaims the entries. It'll block if we don't clear the DD bit. Um, it's kind of not a great way to test for that, but okay. So we're gonna change, here's the receive control register. We're gonna set the size. 
B size here, we're sending it to 1B1, which is 256 bytes. So this will dramatically reduce the size of the uh, the buffers. And we're going to see, this should only use 256 on those now. Yeah, it does. And then in this case, the status is 1. And this is saying 1 means, uh, yeah. So what this does is it caps the packet size to 256, and then the status bit, um, this is telling us that this descriptor's done, this is telling us this descriptor's done, and then the seven, when the when bit number one is set, uh, that's indicating that the receive is complete. And thus, that's how I actually know that this, this, and this combine to make a complete packet, because this packet is just all four ones. So, um, So if I set that back to zero, so yeah, this is just, as long as the packet can hold a full packet size, and since we're not using jumbo frames, it can. In fact, jumbo frames will get rejected instead of split up. So we basically have Wireshark, right? We, we wrote Wireshark. And we can send these packets. 346 is the maximum size that we're seeing there, which I'm kind of surprised by that. I'm surprised it's only sending 346. Seven, seven, five EE. Oh, five EE, 346 is the remainder. Heck, uh, Python, five EE, 1518, yes. So that's the maximum possible size that can be transmitted over the network without jumbo frames. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And we're just seeing different IP headers here. Okay, looks fantastic. All right. So this we're gonna do alloc fizz, allocate a, uh, a value in less than or equal to 4K uh, physical memory for a kilobyte aligned. So we'll call alloc fizz. Uh, allocate map the memory is RW. Because yeah, that those PCI devices will actually snoop. No snoop is the opt-in. All right. So now we have these buffers coming through. Um And what I should be able to do, I'm going to hack something in quick to see if the NIC stops receiving packets after 8, and I'm pretty sure it will. So I'm going to say if the len is 0, do nothing. And then here, I'm not actually going to, I'm not going to give control back to the device. So if the length is 0, we'll spin. And then here, I will write the length back to zero. Okay. So we should only see eight packets. Okay, the fact that I'm seeing more is a little concerning. Huh. Because we don't set the status to zero, which means the DD bit is still set. So I guess I want to do Q size minus 16 then. So this will only give me seven packets, I think, but it will correctly stop. No, that keeps going. I'm actually really confused. I'm really confused. I don't know hard I don't know how it just keeps receiving packets even though I'm not putting more up for use. So 
Because I'm pretty sure when the DD bit is set... Um... Blah, blah, blah. Storage. Fetching. Okay. Pack all that stuff together. Here's the queue structure. Adds by advancing the tail pointer to refer to the address of the entry just beyond the last valid Okay. By writing the descriptor tail registers with the offset of the entry. And I'm guessing that offset is in bytes. Maybe it's in entries. Um, descriptor head. The head pointer. Okay, maybe, maybe it's not the size and bytes for the tail. I'm gonna set this to two. So I'll give it zero and one. So that's like the length effectively. Let's see if we get two packets. Yeah, we got two pack. Okay, it's 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 the number of entries, not the number of bytes. Woof. So yeah, there we got two packets, which is great. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna set this to rx descripts len. So that's basically the number of descriptors as u32. So in this case, it doesn't stop. Weird. Weird. Reset. Welcome back, jump out. So that stops. It's not inclusive, is it? No. Go. So it doesn't stop because it never gets to this stage. I guess there always has to be one. There always has to be one unused entry. Huh. I think. Um, should only write to it is after a reset and before enabling the receiver. Correct. So we write the head. Uh, if it writes to it while it was enabled, can be invalid. Okay. Points to 16 byte datum. Writes the tail register to add descriptors to the hardware free list. So if I do, what if I do zero here? I think this won't receive a single packet. Okay. And if I set it to one, it'll receive one packet. There's my one packet. Okay, great. So what I think I need to do is I set the tail to the ID of that. Mm 
minus one. This. Okay, that stops. And that's once we get seven packets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I think... And if I write the status out... Um, okay, that stops. Good. So I think every time I receive a packet, I will set the free equal to the PID that I just received. Is that correct? Um, so when I receive zero, I will then set this to zero because I know the head is incremented. Yeah, so I think that's what I do. So the last one is software controlled. I have it pointing to len minus one. One packet comes in, I then set it to len. This will always leave one, so this should always work forever. So now, yeah, now we can receive multiple packets. And I'm gonna change this to four, this and 10. Oh yeah, and I, I have this code broken right now. This is uh, while the status and one, that's gonna check the DD bit. So while that is equal to zero, so while, this, while the descriptor is not done, and we'll reformat this code in a second, um, reset. This, oops, uh, range 10, send 10 A's. Okay, so that's working. Do I want to set to PID minus one? No. I just want to set to PID. Yeah, I think this is what I actually want to do. And then if I weren't to update this, it would stop. So we'll reset it, and then this should stop after seven packets. And it does. Perfect, because we're not updating the packet ID. Okay, perfect. So I think we have this figured out now. So we can start working on, well, we gotta wrap all this stuff up, make this code really nice. So allocate a value in physical memory, making sure it is four kilobyte aligned. So allocate, get access to physical memory, uh, make sure the allocation fits in a single page, get a virtual address, allocate a page, map it in as non-executable and writable and present. Initialize the memory with a val based on what was provided. So initialize the memory and then here we return out the virtual mapping. So we allocate the arcs descriptors and the buffers. Um, then, so create the RX descriptors, and then this is uh, create the RX buffers. Reset the network card, wait for it to clear, program the base. And I think for writes, we just do the same thing. So let's, uh, We currently have this receiving a lot of stuff. So I think I wanna limit this down. I don't want store bad packets. So enable, unicast promiscuous, passes without filtering out. Otherwise, 
the Ethernet controller accepts or rejects unicast packets based on the destination address based on the received packet destination address match with uh, one to the 16 one of the 16 stored addresses so if I do if I just enable it so three is unicast that's multicast so I think this will only handle packets that are sent to the MAC address. I might need to program the MAC address. I'm not sure. So let's see. So this won't pick up the broadcast. Thanks for all the follows, everyone. Okay, so we're seeing packets come in. And I think these are only packets that are directed explicitly to us. Which would make sense. <laughs> Vape Goth, I like that name. Hell yeah. Um, so I'm going to send to 101.11. That's the actual address of that machine. And we're not able to send those packets through to it. But this is the destination, I think. Multicast promiscuous, we don't need. So this will just enable RX. And that only enables receiving. Um, set the base. Write in the queue descriptors, set the head, set the tail, enable RX, and then we can pull for the status, and we'll rewrite all this code. But, okay. So now we want to do the same for TX. Create the TX descriptors. They're the same shape, if I'm not mistaken. TX and TX. Create the TX buffers. Uh, TX, TX, TX. Okay, so now we want to do basically the same thing, but for TX, and we'll enable RX at the end. Set the transmit descriptor base. This is the TX. Let's take a look at these. Where's that summary at? Um, TX descriptors. Doop, doop, doop. We got to find that big table of all the registers. Okay. Here we have the transmit descriptor base low. This is at 3,800. 3,804 for the high, 3,808 for the length. I see a pattern here. Set the head and the tail, 3,810 for the head, 3,018 for the tail. We actually don't want to do that for these TX uh, anyways. So we're setting all the TX stuff and then The head for the transmit. Actually, let's read this manual. Packet transmission. So you got a. This is how it works. You have the base address, base plus one. You've got the head, the tail. So the head holds an index value that indicates the in progress descriptor. Reading this register returns the value of the head corresponding. Okay. That holds the tail. So I, I think we just put, I think we increment the tail. So we set the tail. So this will cause us to transmit. I think this will literally cause us to transmit all the packets. So 
We'll set the tail to zero, which will say don't send anything. And then enable TX. This is in the, where's the T control? Here we go, transmit control, enable transmit. This is at, I'm guessing it's at 200. 400, enable transmit. <clears throat> okay, so this won't transmit anything yet. And then, descriptors will be fetched, be written back, multiple transmit queues, don't really care. Legacy descriptors, okay. Uh, what are those descriptors? Blah, blah, blah. Prepares the packet headers. Sets the TDT to indicate there's something to send. Hardware senses the TDT change. It's written back to the descriptor queue. Entire packet sent. So what is a descriptor? Here we go. Here's a legacy transmit. We got a length field. Maximum length for that is that. Checksum offset and start. It's for checksum offload, which... Um... We're not doing that right now. Byte fields, end of packet. So I think we just set end of packet. I'm pretty sure. So we're gonna we're gonna YOLO this a bit. So we'll say a legacy transmit descriptor. Packet transmission, data storage. This is a legacy TX descriptor. We have a buffer. Dtype, DX. Okay. Do you have a length? Oh, these are like split up into... No, that's byte, byte, okay. So we've got a buffer, a length, an offset for the checksum, a command, STA, RSV, CSS, and then special. CSO, CMD. Oh, these are combined. Let's say status here. So you have four bytes plus a U16 plus a U16. So, Yes, that's 64 bits. Um, so I'll make the transmit descriptors. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set a TX desks zero dot length is equal to 50. Check some offsets, command field, command and status, reserved. TX desks one, uh, zero dot CMD. 
is equal to one. That's the end of packet. Report status. All right, insert FCS. Controls whether the insertion of the frame control is normal. IFCS is only valid when EOP is set. So that's going to insert the CRC field in the Ethernet packet. And I think we're going to need that. So we'll set the um, one or one. So I'll set FCS and end a packet. Length is 50. I'm pretty sure we just kick the tail. And that will send that packet. So, how do you prevent alignment issues in Rust? Uh, you can repper C and repper packed, so you can pack structures. In this case, all of these structures um, are naturally aligned, all the fields. So we don't, we're not actually marking these as packed, but there's a repper packed that you can use for that if you need to. Okay, so we're gonna do Wireshark on um, Verber2. Okay, and we'll see if we get a packet. It's gonna be fully empty, so I don't know. Length 44 bytes. No. We might we might have to actually make that a broadcast packet. Cause we're not, we're not sending a valid packet right now. Um, if I just set the destination. I might just, yeah, I might just set the destination to all F's. And see what happens. Or we'll set the whole packet to Fs. So we'll do TX buffs zero dot iter mute for each X. X is not zero. So we're gonna send all Fs as a packet. That'll just show up as a broadcast potentially. Okay. And we kick that tail out. We set that descriptor. Insert a checksum at the offset based on the CSO, which we're not using. Interrupt delay enable. We enable TX. Fs in chat for the Fs. Is this just part? Uh, is this just for fun or part of a bigger project that you're working on? I use this for, um, well, this doesn't exist yet, but I'm working on this to be my kernel that I do most of my research in. So I do a bunch of different research on looking for vulnerabilities in software, as well as uh, doing research in trying to find um, uh, interesting like CPU behavior. So I use this for CPU introspection. I'm gonna set the length to 64. We're gonna see if that works. Um, so it's mainly just a playground that I'll use for arbitrary research. It's effectively the goal. Okay, so I I kick that back. I set the length. Length is per segment. So we send the whole packet. IP offloading. Wow, there's TCP segmentation offload? Wow, that's pretty fancy. For this old of a device? I guess it's gigabit. It's pretty important. Um, so... If I set the transmit, so here's where it's really difficult. 
I don't know if I'm not seeing the packet because it's not getting transmit, or if I'm not seeing the packet because the packet's just garbage and we're not receiving it on our side. Um, I think Wireshark is set to promiscuous. Yeah. So, packet would be discarded, do the bad checksum. I think Wireshark should be able to get bad checksum packets. I'm pretty sure. So it's kind of hard to say. Let me actually see. I can check, I can read the head. So I can do uh, nick.read ox3810. So this will read the head from the transmit queue, which should get updated by hardware. I might have to add a delay. Oh, it is one. And if I don't update that to one, it should be at zero. That means that the packet actually did get transmit. It's at zero. And then if I don't set this command to one, it should also be at zero, because it's probably not going to send that packet. Oh, it's at one. Okay, maybe I set these bits wrong on this definition here. Here's the dis legacy format. Length, uh, buffer, length, CSO, CMD, status, and RSV combined, reserved. And then CSS. Check some start, check some offset. So we don't care about those. Status is the status. CMD is the command. And here's the command field. Interrupt delay, extension, report packet sent. When sent, defers writing the DD bit in the status byte until it's been sent or it results in an error. Oh, it'll still send something that isn't EOP. That makes sense, because it'll, it'll buffer that. So I think it is sending that packet. OK, so to solve that problem, we're going to grab a um, we're going to grab a broadcast packet. Let's just find here's some ARPs. Here's a broadcast ARP. That's what I want. So I'm going to copy as mm, escape string. Oh, yeah. Now we're hacking. TX buffs zero, copy, uh, and this is just going to be const test packet u8 is equal to bytes. OK, and now we can do tx buffs zero dot dot test packet dot len dot copy from slice test packets. All right, what are you guys' thoughts? Do you think we're gonna see that packet? That's us. I'm pretty sure that's us. Yeah, okay, that's definitely us. Uh, we can add some A's to it now just to prove that it's us, but it, it definitely is. Um, reset. Here it is. I guess Wireshark isn't going to probably show the A's at the end. Oh, yeah, there's the padding. There's the A's. We did it. We did it. So 
We definitely are sending packets. Alright, so I'm gonna hit the head, we'll be back, and we'll, uh... We'll start buttoning this stuff up, and we'll, uh, write an IP and, t uh, UDP stack. So, now we have the raw transmits done, so... We'll move to the next stage. Okay, so one thing that we need to check uh, is whether or not let's. I'm gonna turn off the FCS, uh, the checksum for the whole Ethernet frame. I'm gonna see if this still comes through, and it does. Oh, FCS is incorrect. Nice. So that literally should be that. Okay. So if we do this, that'll inject the FCS. Now I think. I don't know if I have to say plus four bytes. Um, that's saying the frame check sequence is invalid. Can we build it? Bad checksum, should be that. Ethernet FCS incorrect. Okay. So let's see. I might need to. Oh, I'm also not sending the correct length. Uh, test packet. So I don't know if I'm supposed to give the packet length minus four or plus four or whatever uh, to accommodate that FCS that the card is inserting. Okay, that was valid. That was purely valid. So if I add four, that's just gonna send some more zeros, I think. Okay, yeah, so this had some additional shit afterwards. Where are the bytes? There we go, there are the bra bytes. Okay, that's what I wanted to see. This is all I care about. So this has four extra bytes at the end. So if I do this, I'm giving it the length of the actual packet, and we control all the bytes to the, to the end, to a T. Now if I get rid of the FCS, uh, where I don't have the NICs and the FCS, I think we'll lose some bytes. Okay, I'm kind of confused by that. Insert FCS. Controls the insertion of the FCS field into normal Ethernet packets. Only valid when EOP is set. So we have EOP set. I would kind of suspect that we wouldn't be inserting the FCS if we don't specify that bit. So I'm kind of confused why we're not getting invalid frame check. Um, if I do plus four here, what happens? And we got those four bytes. I'm gonna put this to a, B, C, D, E, F. As I'll have the four nulls afterwards. T 
trailers that... I don't know. I, I, I don't know how that's not affecting anything. A, B, C, D, E, F. 34, and if I get rid of that, does that change anything about the shape of the packet at all? And I don't think so. Yeah, it's identical. Mm. Well, I think we want that bit set, but we should be able to do this. And then what I can do is, let's see if we can get this looping. So we're gonna loop. And then we're gonna write the, for the packet in zero dot dot, tx desks len, say i i, send i i, i i, set the length. Then we're gonna set the, the end will be equal to i i plus one mod tx desks len. So that's gonna send a bunch of packets, but this is gonna drop a bunch of stuff. Um, so I think what we wanna do is while tx desks or er, while nick dot read thirty eight ten while this is so it starts out as zero zero then we update if it's equal while the head is Yeah, I need to check if the head is behind. This should work. This should spam packets. Uh, SU32 for this whole thing. So this will update the tail. And then what I want to do is I don't want... Yeah, so this is just spamming. <clears throat> Good to see. Good to see. Um, but the problem is, I think I'm dropping a bunch of packets because I'm not waiting for, I set that and then I want to wait. So I can do this. I can do while nick.read ox3810 is not equal to um i i this will wait until it's sent i think uh actually this is uh tail is equal to this tail so update the tail while this is not equal to the tail. So this will wait until hardware has sent it. But this will only do one pack at a time. So this will like really hurt the speeds. Let's actually send packets pretty fast. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, we killed Wireshark. <laughs> Wireshark down. Easy. On pause. Okay, let's see. Uh, see how many packets per second this is. Wow, this is like surprisingly fast. I guess this is a 
since this is emulated, it might actually be pretty fast. So we've got four, 435, 426. And this is the end packet. End time is equal to 5.7662143.24. And then we'll just go somewhere up here, grab these, and we'll say start pack is equal to 51202. Start time is equal to 0.68566189.6. Not that that many floating point digits matter. EP minus SP divided by ET minus ST. 75,000 packets a second. It's pretty damn good when Wireshark's listening. Um, but we're we're doing this really inefficiently by uh, not batching these packets. So what I need to do... Well, I think we might start with this. We might start with this, get this working, and then... Because um, this is always correct. This will just wait for that packet to transmit. So that'll be nice and safe. So here we'll do pub fn transmit mute self and then we'll store these packet buffers. And before we create the nic Okay. So here we'll store the Rx descriptors, Rx descriptors, fizz, Tx descriptors, Tx descriptors, fizz, and the Tx buffs, and the Rx buffs. Okay. And we're going to close some of these. All right. Uh, split that, and then we'll go up to Intel GBET structure. And here we will say, that's the MMIO space for the device. Then we can say the RX desks. This is the... Mm. descriptors so now we want to start actually doing this code nicely so we'll start polishing this a little bit more so this is a so this is a legacy we'll say Rx desk receive descriptor for Intel network cards. Uh, we'll just say legacy receive descriptor, legacy send descriptor or transmit. Rx descriptors is going to be a static mutable reference to. Legacy RX descriptor, and this is the number of descriptors that we have. So this is the um, someone plus Wireshark. Oh, fire! Wireshark is so broken, man. So broken. So this is the virtual, uh, virtually mapped. Rx descriptors. Then we'll have the Rx descriptors. Okay. We have the Rx descriptors fizz. 
And how big are these? How many can we fit on a page? 4,096, they're 16 bytes each. 256, so we'll do 256. This is a page worth of descriptors for each. And this will be TX descriptors. This is the um, physical address of the RX descriptors. Is adder descriptors okay, and then we'll have the rx buffers. This is a static mute u8 2048 2048 for 256, and these are the uh receive buffers. Corresponding to the oops, corresponding to the uh, descriptors. Okay, gonna do the same thing for TX now. Like, see TX descriptor, TX descriptors of TX descriptors of that. TX buffers, transmits buffers corresponding to the to their ah, semicolon on both of these. One ninety. Legacy. Rx descriptor, and here we'll have const, oops, const num tx desks u size is equal to 256, const num rx desks. So this is the uh, number of receive. Um, Number of receive descriptors to allocate per device. Number of transmit descriptors to allocate per device. Uh, max is 256. So that'll fit in a page. 226. Yeah, we'll say RX descriptors, RX descriptors, fizz, buffers, same for all these, sorry, TX, TX descriptors, uh, yeah, let's fucking redo this, create the RX descriptors, Desks. Okay. And then this, this is the RX buffers. Current side project is an ARM V8 kernel for fun. Cool to see it on Intel. Hell yeah. I've never done an ARM64 OS dev, but I've done ARM... Uh, 32 OS dev. RX buff. So it's going to be allocate a new uh, packet buffer. Store the packet buffer in the descriptor. Uh, descriptor table. And then this is uh, save the address of the. Uh, of the buffer, save the virtual, save the reference to the buffer in that vector. Okay, and then all this code we comment out because we're currently not using it. Turn out the network card. I guess RX buffers is going to be a
Yeah, I currently have that as a fixed size array. I'm doing a bunch of ARMv5 stuff. I've never done ARMv5. I think I did... Actually, ARMv5 is what they use on um, the Cortex like M3 and M4, I think, right? In which case, I have done work on that. Rx buffers. Okay, so we have a vector. We'll actually do that. We'll change Rx buffers. So this will be a vector of mutable references to these. Pretty sure. Nice, 215. And this will be max rx desks, or num rx desks. And we'll assert num rx desks is less than 256, less than or equal to 256, and num tx desks. Uh, and this will be invalid uh, intel gigabit uh, constant configuration. It's going to be make sure that the descriptor tables fit on a single page. There are 16 byte entries, thus we make sure that we never use more than 256 entries per table. Okay, now we can allocate the TX descriptors. Paste the SRX with TX. Pretty sure. RX. Yeah, I think that'll do the trick. TX buffers, 243. Yep, TX buffers. Okay. So I'll allocate all those, and then here, reset the NIC, wait for the reset to clear, program the receive descriptor base, write in the size of the descriptor queue, set the head, set the tail, program the transmit descriptor base, set the head, set the tail, enable RX, enable TX. So this should be valid. Um, uh, percent s under desks under descriptors. Fuck yeah. Descriptors. Ripters, Ripters, uh, two forty one. Um, Yeah, I think I moved those into those structures. So let's, uh, we'll polish this up a little bit. Old Cortex is maybe working on old ARM 9 chips. Oh, wow. On my kernel switching 64-bit ARM, uh, uh, meant redoing all the exception handling uh, and will likely re require a rewrite of the MMU code. Oh man, that sucks. Wait for the reset to clear. Program the descriptor base. Low, high, and we'll do this because we can. And this will be on the nick. Oh, we just barely don't fit. Okay, nick dot this. Write the descriptor, write the size of the 
RX descriptor queue. And those are in bytes, I'm pretty sure. I should probably check that. Let's, let's fucking check that before we YOLO it. Um, receive descriptor length, number of bytes allocated to the circular receive buffer. Okay, perfect. Set the RX head, set the RX tail, set the program to the transmit descriptor base. Shift by zero, as U32, low and high. These are on the NIC. NIC dot, NIC dot. Run the size of the TX descriptor queue, and then we'll kind of batch these just because we can. TX head and the TX tail. Oops. That's. I sometimes like using scoping to kind of really separate these. This is a. Uh, Program the RX side. Uh, here, we'll say initialize the NIC for receive. Initialize the NIC for transmit. And we're having soft reboot issues, right? Uh, reset. Nice, because we kill that Nick. Beautiful, because we hijack it. Uh, I mean, we definitely know transmit receive works now. So, RX. Enable RX, enable TX. And then at this point, I suspect, yeah, if I were to soft reboot, I would probably have issues here, so I need to disable interrupts. And those are done through probably control, I would guess. Sent link up, speed selection, force speed. Device reset. Flow control enable. Turn that shit off. Fire reset. Status. Yeah, what is the what is the interrupt register then? I would assume it'd be one of the first few ones. Interrupt cause read, interrupt throttling, interrupt cause set. Software uses this to set an interrupt condition. Any bit one sets the corresponding interrupt. I think that just sets those bits. Yeah, that sets the cause bits. It's not actually what I want. Um, interrupt mask. Probably the IMS then. Got support for 35, 14, which, which RFC is that one? An interrupt is enabled if its corresponding mass bit is set to 1B, and it's disabled if it's set to 0B. It's generated each one at a time, set. Sets the mask. Since when do you use the mask bit as one to specify that it is enabled? <laughs> it's kind of weird. Anyways, let's uh, let's print that out after the reset. We're gonna print hex nick dot read oxdo. 
Feels like that's inverse of what I would expect, but doesn't matter. That is currently set to zero. Sets mask for transmit. Let's see if I can find interrupts. Here we go. Um, register. Records the interrupt causes. Enables software to set bits in the interrupt cause. Clears bits in the interrupt mask. Sets or reads bits in the interrupt mask. Interrupts appear on PCIe only if the cause bit is a one and the corresponding mask bit is a one. Uh, blocks assertion of an interrupt by clearing the corresponding bit in the mask register. Okay, so doesn't this say reset? Most things will, uh, we want the software reset. Here, software initialize, disable interrupts, issue a global reset, perform configuration, initialize receive, initialize transmit, stats counters, set up the final link. I think we're fine in just the default uh, link state for all these. I think it's auto negotiate for everything after reset. And then enable interrupts, see interrupts during initialization. Okay. Interrupts are disabled by writing to the IMC register. Okay, so we want to write to the IMC. Um, IMC uses this to disable an interrupt. Interrupts are presented to the bus only when the mask bit is set to 1B. Blots interrupts by clearing it. This is accomplished by writing a 1B to the corresponding bit. Um, reserved. Should be written as 1B. Clears those. Should be written as 1. So we're going to clear all interrupts. So do a nick.write ox uh, d8 not zero. So this will write all Fs to the IMR, IMC to disable all interrupts, right? So I'll disable all interrupts, reset the NIC, wait for it to, wait for it to actually reset, disable all interrupts, initialize the receive side of the network card, Initialize the set the RX head, set the RX tail. EIMC, I'm not familiar with that at all. Set the RX head, set the RX tail. Low and high. Set the base, TX descriptor fizz. TX descriptors, set the size, set the TX head, set the TX tail. So we're, and then at this point, enable RX, enable TX. Not zero is a hilarious construct for a constant all ones, yeah. Anyways, we should be able to call transmit now. And transmit will Um, so we need to have our own TX head and tail internally. TX head, U size, and this is the uh, current head to write to. Uh, current head, hmm, current index of the next free transmit buffer slots. And then we'll have so set TX head. And then we can set TX head is zero. All right. 
let tail is equal to self.tx head plus one mod self.tx descriptors dot len compute the tail index uh, for this transmit. Then we're going to do, oh, and this will take a payload. This is going to transmit a raw packet. Transmit a raw Ethernet frame uh, with the IC, uh, the transmit word configuration. What is the, um, we're going to have this set with the, the IFCS. Okay. So this will insert FCS with the FCS automatically inserted by the Nick. So we're going to just send a packet. Should be pretty easy. So we'll do self dot TX buffers self dot TX head dot copy up oh, dot dot payload dot len dot copy from slice payload copy the payload into the uh, transmit buffer and technically you could like reuse the payload there's so many things that you can do to like speed these things up so copy the payload into the transmit buffer then we're going to self.tail or self.tx head is equal to self. TX head plus one or tail. This will be bump the uh, TX head as we've used this slot. And then here we can do self dot write OX3818 tail. Uh, bump the tail pointer on the nick. So we'll get the tail index for this transmit, copy the payload into the transmit buffer, and then we'll bump that in, and then bump that we've used that, and then while self.read OS3810 is not equal to tail as U32, and then wait for the nick to actually transmit the packet. This is like super synchronous, uh, and we'll relax this in a minute. We're just gonna get stuff working because this is safe. This is like super easy, um, super simplified. So get the TX head, add one to it, mod that by the descriptor's length. That'll give us the tail. At the current head, which is zero, we copy in the payload. We then bump the tail pointer on the nick. That'll cause it to get sent. We then bump the TX head as we've used the slot. Oh, we also need to uh, fill in the TX descriptor. So we'll do self.TX descriptors, TX head dot uh, CMD is equal to one shift one or one shift zero. That's going to set that it's the last packet to send and then also have it compute the FCS. Once again, we'll turn these into constants shortly. Unsafe this. Unsafe this. Okay. Fill in the descript uh, fill in the descriptor. Oh, and the length. Len is equal to payload.len as you 16. Okay, set the length, set the command. Bump the tail. 
wait for the head on the nick to catch up to where we are. So now I should be able to do a nick.transmit, and then here I can take that test packet. We'll just dd that. Test packet. So we're gonna now send that packet. So we'll just send one of those ARPs. Reset. And we should, at the end, have one ARP. And we do, that's our ARP that we sent. Perfect. And it should have an A, B, C, D, E, F at the end. Uh, where's the raw? Yep, A, B, C, D, E, F. So that is the packet that we sent. Okay, so transmit works, and let's make sure we can transmit multiple times. Uh, loop. Don't care about indenting, so this should be spamming. Definitely looks like it's spamming. Sending plenty of packets there. Okay, go back to a single, reboot it, cut down on that noise. All right. What programming language are you using? This is all in Rust right now. So this is uh, receive the a raw Ethernet frame from the NIC pub fn receive mute self um, buffer mute u8 so we'll return a u size maybe I'll take a mute mute u8. We'll do this. So here we're going to wait for the um yes yeah, so we'll have an RX head. RX head U size uh, current index of the receive buffer which is next in line to get a packet from the nick okay rx head 0 332 and then here we're going to say while the self.rx descriptors for rx head dot what's the status bit on that status or to call status while the status and one is zero uh, wait for this descriptor to be populated by the nick and so I'll check the DD bit and then we'll do self dot rx descriptors self dot rx head dot status is equal to zero. Set the head to zero. Uh, clear the status to put the buffer back up for use. And this will let our self.rx head is equal to self.rx head plus one mod self.rx descriptors.len uh, bump the rx head. And then we want to write the let the nick know this buffer is available available for use again and we'll do this by writing self dot write to ox we're gonna write to the rx tail 2818 2818 we're gonna write to there with the current rx head So that'll end up writing a zero, 
that'll give it space and then we'll increment the RX head here. So wait for that to come in from the nick, and then we gotta get the length from here. Self.rx descriptors, self.rx head.length, I think len. Uh, let rx get the length of the rx buffer and copy into the caller supplied buffer. So we'll do buffer dot rx copy from slice self dot rx buffers self dot rx head dot dot rx <laughs> so that will get the length that was received and then at the very end we'll re we'll return rx rx head as u32 on safe so this will allow us to receive multiple packets we'll wait for it this is blocking, so this will wait for that packet to be ready. Um, okay. Hey, Project Wolf. How's it going? Um, wait for the descriptor to be populated. It starts off at rx head zero. We then get the length of the rx buffered. And we copy from the buffer at the head into the buffer that was passed in. We clear the status to put the buffer back up for use. Um, and then we let the nick know that the buffer is available for use again. And then we bump the RX head internally. Okay. I think this should work now. Um, oh, and we have to assert that these are mod and num rx desks mod eight is equal to zero and num rx desks is greater than zero. num tx desks mod eight zero okay uh and this num tx desks mod eight is equal to zero and num tx desks driven zero okay um tx descriptor uh Rx and TX descriptor tables must also be uh, divisible by eight for their number of entries as a requirement of the 128 bits bytes cache line sizes implemented in the NIC. So make sure that that. Okay. Make sure that the descriptor number is less than or equal to 256. Make sure that modding it by eight, wow. Modding it by eight should be zero. And there should be a, a non-zero amount. And that makes sure that we program valid things for all of these buffers. So at this point, I should be able to, I'll enable Rx and Tx. I should be able to while or loop let me buff is equal to OU8 1024 or we'll just do buff and then we can do buff dot receive yeah rec v send send rec v into mute buff let bread is equal to this, print. Now we can print the packet that we got. 
and we'll print uh, O2X buff dot dot bread. That should print what we received, and we should have receives working now. Uh, oh, this is not on buff. This is on Nick. Okay, here we go. Uh, and we just kind of got to wait for packets to come in. We actually probably should add broadcasts in there. Enable RX. And then we'll have the RX stuff handle broadcasts. That is the receive control register. And this will be broadcast accept. Um, and accept broadcast packets. So we'll take broadcast packets as well as packets that were destined to our network card. Reset. And then we just got to wait for an ARP or something to happen. Uh, that was a non-broadcasting ARP. Oh, there's a broadcast ARP. Okay, so we didn't get that. What did we break? What is numRx desks? That's the number of received descriptors that we allow. So it's basically the number of packets that we will buffer. Um, it's the number of packets that will buffer in the ring buffer. So we give the network card a list of a bunch of buffers that it can use to store packets as they come in. Um, and currently, we have that set to, uh, I think, 256 buffers. So the network card can, ooh, enable is one, okay. Uh, unicast promiscuous, we're gonna add that as well. But yeah, it's basically the, the number of entries that we'll give to the NIC to allow it to buffer. All right, let's see if this prints. Okay, uh, we broke something. Set the RX tail, 2818. While the status in one is zero. Oh yeah, um, that's getting optimized out. I think. Let's try this. Oops. Ref that, unsafe. In fact, pretty much everything here we should probably be using. Um, and one, okay. Pretty much everything here we should be doing volatile reads and writes, but I think this will fix that issue. Probably do a volatile right. Yeah, we're getting packets now. Okay, so that was the issue. Good to know. So I'll pull in use core pointer read volatile and write volatile. And I'm pretty sure that all of these. Yeah, we'll make sure that the writes happen. So the volatile is really just important on multiple reads. It's honestly just for reads that we need to worry about. So let's go down to here. Read volatile, ref that. Unsafe this. Well, read volatile. Then we update, we get the length. I don't think I have to read volatile on that, but we can. No, we, we don't have to read volatile on that. We only have to read if the compiler, ah, I guess it could inline it. And it could get smart about it. 
Yeah, anywhere where the valley could have changed. Or where the compiler... Yeah, we'll grab right volatile as well. And that means we'll basically unsafe these whole functions. Buffer. Copy this. Pretty much any time we access the descriptor, we should be using volatile. write a zero and then here that's fine that's not actually reading so when we read volatile uh, boo, 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 unmatched print and get rid of this print there we go 354 no rx in that scope yep so read the descriptor, volatile, pull it, get the length, write the status. And I don't know if I need to volatile read for this copy. I think technically I need to. So we'll, we'll get back to that. But like in, in theory, with some weird inlining, I don't know if volatile can go across uh, function call boundaries, but I am concerned that if everything gets inlined in one big function, it might think it can omit that. And then we have some dead unsafe blocks now. Okay. While read volatile and one is zero, then we don't have a packet. Read volatile from the descriptor. Copy from slice, rx, and then here we write volatile. Okay. Same thing for transmit. We're gonna update all of these to use volatile. Also means we can get rid of these. So these will do um, write. Volatile, mute, this, comma, write volatile, mutable reference to this, write that. So we fill those in, volatile, copy the payload into the transmit buffer. So it's just those two that might need to be cleaned up, but this should work. This should give us effectively Wireshark sort of outputs. You just need packets. There's some packet co packets go through, and we're seeing all of them. Okay. So now, that was the unicast one. So we'll set, except broadcast, which is 15. Yeah, broadcast accept mode. We'll want broadcast for some of the ARPs and some of the DHCP stuff we do early on. So that's why we have that set up. Yep, we got packets coming in. Okay, sweet. So receive a raw ethernet frame from the network card. We're gonna make this an option. And then here we'll say uh, let's present is equal to read. Yeah, we'll yoink this line. Present is equal to read that and one is not equal to zero. Uh, check if there is a packet that is ready 
to read. If not present, return none. Uh, no, no packet present. Actually, gonna read that volatile. And if it's not equal to zero, then it's present. If it's not present, no packet. Otherwise, return sum rx. And now it's non blocking. So this will just print none. Oh, we're not receiving. Uh, loop print. We'll print the self.recv or nick recv mute OU8 1024. So this should just print none. A lot. A lot of nuns. Okay. And then if we change our test.py, Python test.py, there should be some sum values that show up in here. And we'll put this in a uh, while true. So we're just going to spam packets. Um, 255. Okay. So, yep, we're spamming packets. Cancel. Spam packets. Cancel. Sweet. Okay, so now that ha that has blocking I/O, that's much or non-blocking I/O, that's much better. So now we can start actually implementing a uh, not even stack. I think I might need to program. Let's go look at the Unicast stuff here. Oh, and let's get this working for other Nicks as well. Well, right now we only have it for the 8100, or the E1000, uh, the non-E variant. But we're pretty close. Discard pause frames. So I think what I want to do here is I want to get the... If set, passes without filtering. Otherwise, the Ethernet controller accepts or rejects unicast packets based on the received packet destination address match with one of the 16 stored addresses. So somewhere we store addresses. I actually need to get the MAC address of the device pretty badly. So are those... The MAC address, I think that we get that actually out of the SRAM. Or the EEPROM. E scored from read register. Flash. Uh, five specific status. Transmit FIFO tail. Oh, those are the internal ones. Number of packets transmitted. So these are like, uh, yeah, stats. Don't care about these stats. Bunch of stats. Receive side, multicast table array, receive address. Are these the, uh, yeah, let's take a look at some of these. Controls the fetching and write back of received descriptors. Interesting. Prefetch, host threshold, write back threshold. Receive. 
Receive checksum. Registry controls the receive checksum offloading features of the Ethernet controller. The Ethernet controller supports the offloading of three checksum calculations, the packet checksum, the IP header checksum, and the TCP and UDP checksum. Frame types that are supported, Ethernet 2, snap. OK. Packet checksum start. Controls the starting byte of the packet checksum ch calculation. It's the one complement over the receive packet. You know, this documentation isn't that bad, guys. <laughs> we're, we're deep in the data sheets, but this is actually pretty good. So, controls the starting byte of the packet checksum calculation. Uh, by default at zero, okay. IP checksum offload enabled. This is used to control the IP checksum offloading feature. If it's set to one, the Ethernet controller calculates the IP checksum and indicates a pass-fail indication to software through the checksum error CSE in the error field of the received descriptor. If both this and this are set, the CSE is set if either the checksum, either checksum was incorrect. Uh, if neither nor that is set, it's the checksum error bit is zero for all packets. Okay. And then this is this is set to enable TCP UDP. And this will check some error if we have a bad checksum. If neither of those are set, it's zero. And then this is IPv6 checksum. Bit 10. One not applicable on the ER. What reference? Oh, VLAN packets. And then two is not applicable. The IPv6 offloading is not applicable on this. OK. Here's the filter registers, the multicast table array. Uh, a way to extend the address filtering beyond the 16 perfect in the, the RAR. Oh, that's what we want. We want the RAR. 16 registers contain the lower bits of the 48-bit Ethernet address. All 32 bits are valid. Software can access the high and low registers as a register pair if it can perform a 64-bit address to the address bus. They are stored for unicast, multicast filtering. Um, contains the lower 32 of the that. So these are basically the tables. So we can set up uh, 16 different MAC addresses that we want to filter on. Um, when writing to this, always write low to high. When clearing it, always clear high to low. Okay. Um, address select. Selects how the destination, how it's to be used for address filtering. Destination address. Address valid determines if this address is compared against the incoming packet. When set, the address is valid and is compared against the incoming packet. Uh, when cleared, it's invalid and not com compared against that. Um, it is only cleared by a PCI reset or software reset. It's unchanged by an RX reset. OK. So all of those are cleared. Yeah, so basically, if we don't accept multicast, we won't get any packets right now because we haven't programmed the MAC address of our uh, of our program. So we'll say if let sum rx is equal to nick receive, and then here we'll print rx. So if we do this, this will basically never print, even if we have packets. 
Uh, because we turn off the broadcast, and if we send... Oh! It is getting packets. What fucking Mac is it filtering on? Let's dump those tables quick. The high and low tables for these Macs. 5400. Um... For I I N zero dot sixteen RAL is equal to Nick dot read OX fifty four hundred plus eight times I I and this is the high which is five oh four print O eight X O eight X R I H R I L Okay, let's see this. Ah! That must be our MAC address. And it's set. It's enabled. So this is basically the MAC address right here. Um, interesting. Let's take a look. We'll reset this, see if we can see those packets. But yeah, we can see the source is coming from there. So the source, 5254-00-F17E-A6. Yes. So that is our actual MAC address. So it already knows our MAC. Uh, I'm kind of surprised. I thought we had to program that in ourselves. I don't know if that's safe to assume that's always there. But maybe it always programs that in? Is used for exact match on pause frame. Should always be used to store the individual of the Ethernet controller. I swore that I had to program that myself sometimes. Um, so this means that I should be able to send to 101.11 here. Uh, oh, I'm RARPing it. Or I'm ARPing it, and it's not responding to ARPs. Okay. So since it's not responding to ARPs, we don't know what... Uh, MAC address to use, but that MAC address is programmed. Um, I'm just afraid that that's not standard. I want to kind of test this on real hardware. We have interrupts dis enabled, right? We have no lock at this level, I don't think. Okay. Uh, I think the borrow checker's a narc. <laughs> it's pretty fair. It's accurate, actually. Um, hmm. Okay, so I need to be able to get that MAC address of the current. Yeah, so we're going to grab that. We're going to read the MAC address for the zeroth index. Let MAC is equal to... Um, Uh, OU8 for 6, assert, ra, and 1 shift 31 is non zero. Uh, whoa, couldn't get Mac. So we're going to assume that if the zeroth entry is filled in, so this is uh, read the receive 
address high and low for the first entry in the rx mac filter uh we think we assume this holds the uh mac address of this nick so we'll copy into mac zero to four copy from slice ril.2 le bytes and then from four to six, we'll do ra as u16, and this should be the MAC address of the device. Uh, I can put a question mark. MAC is this, mute that. Okay, so this will give us the MAC address of the current device. Oh, scroll. MAC is 52540070A6. And I think that's correct. Source is there. So the source, 70A6. Yep. All right, so the MAC address we have. So we can now store that. Um, Mac U86. This is the Mac address of this device. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Nick dot Mac is equal to Mac. The Mac will start out as a zero and then we'll fill it in. 326. Uh, yeah, we want one shift 15, I think was broadcast. Let's go check that again. Receive control register. 15 is broadcast, so we want broadcast coming in. Okay, so that'll let us see the broadcast. So if I try to send this a packet, uh, well, that's, oh, nice. Now that the ARP's over, now we'll see the ARP's. And this is basically, it's trying to request uh, our address. Okay. So I don't think we're actually going to have this networking stack respond to ARP's until we're actually processing messages, I think. Um, yeah, I think if I'm doing a receive, we'll support ARPing. All right. Oh, yeah, we can't. We can't convert an any type to a trait. Shit. Um, since we can't convert an any, yeah, since we can't convert an any to a trait, we can't we can't actually make a network trait. So we have all these network cards, right? We create this network card and these will be registered. Um, but then we need to get access to this functionality. Hmm. Yeah, I got to think about that. Anyways, I think I'm going to call that for this stream. I think tomorrow we'll uh, do the IP, DHCP, UDP stack. But we have uh, raw transmit receives. So this is... Uh, 
Never used TX head, all these, and then here we'll just say, uh, oh, read and write. Allow unused. Uh, PCI device. Yeah, we never do use that. Well, we will get status, get add. Get status, get add kernel source, get commit am added a PCI device enumeration and um, very basic E1000 driver. So that's up there. The spec says on reset, if the EEPROM or NVM is available, the first entry of the Mac filter will get read into the device Mac address. Okay, thank you so much. That is awesome. Sweet. So then we can actually kind of rely on that. We're checking that top bit to make sure that it's set. So, yeah, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, I'm actually, like, super tired. I must not have slept too well last night. But tomorrow will be up bright and early, and... We'll get everything up and running for all of this. Uh, we'll get the UDP stack, IP stack, we'll respond to ARPs, and we'll set up a DHCP thing so we can get an IP address. Um, and then we'll probably write a TFTP client to allow us to download the kernel because once we, once we enable that network driver, we can't soft reboot, right? Because we end up reprogramming the network card. So we'll have to actually download the kernel in the kernel. So that's something we'll have to do. But anyways, hope you guys had fun. Thank you so much for stopping by. See y'all later.